Good evening. This is Mayor Stephen B. Grant. We will now call to order the City of Boynton Beach City Commissioners meeting today, Tuesday, September 1st at 5.36 p.m. Uh, John, would you please provide us with a brief introduction? Yes, hello and welcome. My name is John McNally and I'll be providing assistance to the mayor and the elected officials during today's meeting. Before we start, I'd like to review a few housekeeping items so the public audience knows how to participate. Your microphones have been muted to reduce background noise during this public meeting. There will be specific times during this meeting when members of the public can ask questions and provide feedback. The first way is by typing their question into the questions section at the bottom of the GoToWebinar interface. Those items will be read into the record by a meeting organizer at the appropriate time. Please be sure to include your name for the record. The second way is by using the GoToWebinar interface and clicking on the raise hand option. A meeting organizer will announce the speaker and unmute their audio at which time the speaker should state their name for the record. Before speaking, please take steps to minimize any sources of background noise and speak clearly into your device during your allotted time. I will now turn control over to Mayor Stephen Grant, who will be presiding over today's meeting. Thank you, John. We will begin with an invocation by Reverend Lynn Jones of St. Joseph's Episcopal Church, followed by the Pledge of Allegiance, led by Commissioner Christina Romulus. Good evening. Uh, I just want to correct that. I'm actually from St. Joseph's Episcopal School. Okay. So that's fine. That's fine. Close. So let us pray. O oh God, creator of all, you have given us a vision of that holy city to which the nations of the world bring their glory. Behold and visit, we pray, the cities of the earth, especially Boynton Beach. Renew the ties of mutual regard which form our civic life. Send us honest and able leaders, enable us to eliminate poverty, prejudice, and oppression, that peace may prevail with righteousness and justice with order, and that men and women from different cultures and with differing talents may find with one another the fulfillment of their humanity protect and preserve us and help us to combat the pandemic under which we are currently suffering and help us to keep one another safe. In your holy name we pray, amen. Amen. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. May I have a roll call, please? Mayor Stephen B. Grant. Present. Vice Mayor. Here. Commissioner Justin Katz. Here. Commissioner Woodrow Hay. Well, we see him. I see that Commissioner Hayes present and Commissioner Christina Romulus. Present. Mayor, we have a quorum. Thank you. All right, uh, moving on to uh, agenda approval, any additions, deletions, or corrections? Um, I received a letter of intent from Centennial Management uh, within the past two weeks. I don't see that it's on future agenda. So I wanted to know if the city commission wanted to have a discussion about that regarding the, the purchase and sale agreement um, that we uh, signed with Pulte Homes for the city's property, uh, considered the Nichols property. Have that discussion at, as new business. And if so, I need a motion to amend. Uh, Mayor, I have a question. Yeah. Yes. So do, and maybe city manager can weigh in on that. That letter is an attempt to do something different than what we previously agreed to with a, a different party. Or am I mixing up my information here? Correct. It's a, there's a purchase agreement with Pulte Homes. However, we received a letter of intent for that property because we have not 
signed over the property yet, and we have clauses in the purchase and sale agreement to withdraw from it. Okay. And you're requesting to put that on future agenda items for two weeks? No, not at all. I said it's not on future agenda. Did we want to discuss it now at tonight's uh, meeting? Or I would you want to discuss it later. I'd personally, uh, personally rather speak to staff first just to get a footing on the the legal aspect of of what was in the contract that we could potentially, you know, move move away from what we agreed to. So I, I would request just a future agenda item if possible. Okay. The the reason why I asked today is because any money that Pulte Home spends, we would have to reimburse them. So I guess I'd I'd request from legal do, do they advise we we take this up today because of that fact? Do we have someone from uh, Goran Cheroff here? Yeah, I'm here. Okay. We do. I do not recommend that you take it up this evening. I think it should be on the agenda for discussion. Okay. So then let's put it for a future agenda on uh, the 15th. Mayor, may I clarify, I'll put it on as an actual agenda item versus a future agenda item. We'll put it under new business. Well, we'll put it on tonight's agenda as a future agenda item for the 15th. Okay, to be heard as, okay, regular item. So, may I have a motion to approve as amended? I moved as amended. Second. All those in favor, state so by saying aye. Aye. All those opposed? Hearing none, motion passes unanimously. Uh, informational items by members of the City Commission. Uh, Commissioner Katz, would you like to begin? Sure, thank you very much. I spoke to, um, separately from one another, but I spoke to Harvey Oyer Jr. and Susan Oyer just regarding some downtown development on federal. And I also briefly spoke to Bonnie Miskell relative to Town Square and JKM's portion of that project. And I believe that is all. All right, thank you. Commissioner, uh, hey, are you able to speak? Uh, yes, can, 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 you, can you hear me? We can. Okay. Um, I did speak with uh, Bradley Miller and company, uh, and I also spoke with uh, Bonnie Miscrew on the uh, town square uh, very briefly, and I did get an email from Susan Oyer. Uh, that's it for, for my disclosure. All right, thank you. Uh, Commissioner Romulus. Thank you, Mayor. Um, Ali briefly spoke to Harvey Oyer regarding the uh, property on um, federal, and that is all the disclosures that I have to make. Okay. And Vice Mayor Pinserga. Um, I have no disclosures. At most, I did receive a voicemail from Bonnie Miller, um, Bonnie Miskell, but I didn't have a conversation with her. Right. Uh, myself, um, I had conversations with uh, the transportation agency of Palm Beach County's executive director, Nick Uren, regarding a, a train station along the FEC track for Boynton Beach. I also spoke with uh, Todd Von Laren, uh, community, I'm sorry, the county's deputy administrator regarding the same. I attended the city's general employees public pension meeting on August 24th. I attended uh, the Suits for Seniors Cheers for Change event on August 26th. And, uh, you know, I wanted to speak a little bit about the loss of Chadwick Bozeman uh, to our society and what that really kind of means to a lot of our residents. Um, you know, he was an example of history's, some of history's greatest figures of Jackie Robinson, James Brown, Thurgood Marshall, and the, the fictional character of T'Challa, Black Panther. And so it's something that he, through his skills as an actor, instilled pride um, of changing our culture for the better. And so, you know, I hope with the discussions that we have regarding equity in the, the city that we can somehow honor him for what he's done uh, in the short time he was on this earth. Um, yesterday, I attended a, a meet, uh, the farewell party for Assistant Chief Mike Pesosa, and I saw that we have a, a new Assistant Chief. Is that correct, Lori? 
Yes, Hugh Bruder just started with us. I, I don't know if he actually, I think he's, I don't know if he, what his physical start date was, if he has actually, but yes, That's he's well. one of our uh, assistant deputy chiefs, excuse me. Yeah, okay, wonderful. So uh, those are the disclosures uh, that I have for today. Is there anything else before we move on to announcements? Seeing none? Mayor. Yes. Uh, just a quick, I guess, observation. When we have new senior or high level employees, is it possible for us to have introductions of them done rather than just kind of in passing mentions by the mayor or whomever seems to notice? This is directed towards Lori. Yeah, absolutely. I just, I didn't know what, I don't recall what his start date was. He was in the process last I heard from Julie. So I haven't announced it yet because I don't know when his physical date was. It was literally this week or next week, but absolutely. Thank you. I normally do that and I apologize for that. Yeah, no, I think he just started maybe Monday, so. Yeah, if he did, okay. Yeah, that no, one got it, past me. <laughs> so that, that, that was the situation, but I, I do agree with Commissioner Romulus that we, we do like to know and bring them, you know, in front of everybody. So, you know, we can ask them questions at that time. I'd be or happy just to, like, get we know. to know them. It's not a firing squad, Mayor Sheesh. Yeah. <laughs> well, I, I, you know, Commissioner McCray is no longer here, Please. so it's not as going to be. Commission me. So, our first proclamation uh, is for the month of September as Hunger Action Month. Sari Vatske, uh, Executive Vice President of Feeding, Feeding South Florida, will accept the proclamation. City of Boynton Beach Proclamation. Whereas September is Hunger Action Month, an initiative created by Feeding America to help raise awareness about the issue of hunger in the United States and local communities. And whereas hunger and poverty are issues of great concern to the city of Boynton Beach, it is therefore critical we take action to break the cycle of hunger and poverty and address the root causes of hunger. And whereas the city of Boynton Beach is therefore committed to working with Feeding South Florida, the leading domestic hunger relief organization serving Palm Beach, Broward, Miami-Dade, and Monroe counties, serving 25% of the state's food insecure population. And whereas during COVID, over 1 million individuals in South Florida, over 350,000 of whom are children, rely on food provided by Feeding South Florida and its network of partner agencies annually. Whereas Feeding South Florida distributed over 119 million pounds of food and grocery products in 2020 through its network of 300 nonprofit partner agencies direct service programs, benefit assistance programs, home meal delivery programs, and more. And whereas Feeding America food banks across the country, including Feeding South Florida, will host several events throughout September to raise awareness about the issues of hunger and inspire action toward ending, toward ending it in their local community. Now, therefore, I, Stephen B. Grant, Mayor of the City of Boynton Beach, Florida, to hereby proclaim the month of September 2020 as Hunger Action Month. Sari? Are you there? Yes, thank you so much. Um, I'm Sari Vatsky, the Executive Vice President of Feeding South Florida. Um, and about a year ago, uh, looked very different. We stood in front of the commission and talked about how we were Boynton Beach's best kept secret. Um, and I think it's safe to say that over the past year, that has changed dramatically, um, both because of the increased relationship that we are fortunate to have with the city and unfortunately because of the COVID pandemic. Um, I know you shared a lot of numbers in the proclamation, um, so I have just a few more just to put the increased need in perspective um, together with our friends at the city of Boynton Beach. Um, we've distributed over 3.3 million pounds of food uh, just this past fiscal year to Boynton Beach alone um, out of the 38 million pounds of food that we've provided to Palm Beach County. So about 10% of our annual distribution has gone here um, into our home city. Uh, over 1.3 million of that was from our weekly distributions together. Um, so thanks to the support of uh, the Boynton Beach Police Department, Parks and Rec, um, communications and events team, everybody um, has just been incredible. We've done 16 distributions together, served over 17,000 households, um, and we are happy to share that we will be returning to our weekly Thursday distributions at the Hester Center starting September 17th. We will still continue our uh, fourth Saturday of the month distributions in partnership with Christ Fellowship, the city and the Boynton Beach Mall. Um, 
And we do also uh, just want to acknowledge um, our gratitude for everyone's support in the city for helping us open our new community kitchen. Um, on July uh, 6th or 12th, I'm sorry, July 12th, we are fortunate to have uh, Mayor Grant and Vice Mayor Pinserva come out and visit. Um, our 5,000 square foot kitchen will be able to deal up to 10,000 meals per day. We had a great grand opening. Um, we continue our home delivery program uh, since merging with the Community Caring Center, and we will continue expanding our meal delivery service to seniors um, and children through schools. Um, and while a spotlight has been shined on the issue of hunger throughout the United States, there's still a lot more that we have to do. Um, you know, certainly it's come into the spotlight with COVID and the pandemic, but the reality is what these families are facing right now is something that over 700,000 families faced on a consistent daily regular basis. Um, and so we do anticipate having a serve at this increased need for the foreseeable future. And so that's why we invite the community to go orange with us throughout the month of, month of September uh, to help raise awareness and inspire action towards um, ending hunger in the United States. And so thank you to the city of Boynton Beach. I know that you all have uh, lit the water tower orange starting tonight and throughout the month. Um, thank you for turning your Facebook pages orange and putting our banner up. Um, we are happy to share that we do have a toolkit on our website, feedingsouthflorida.org, that everyone can download uh, some cool snazzy graphics, including Zoom backgrounds uh, for your next meeting, as well as a Facebook profile picture frame. Um, and we have a calendar of events, 30 ways in 30 days, um, hopefully designed to inspire action that everyone can take each day uh, towards doing something to end hunger. Um, so thank you so much to the entire commission, um, city manager, Lori, um, you all are incredible. Um, you know, Colin, the planning and zoning team helping us. Um, don't think we have enough time for us to name every single person in the city that has been instrumental in helping us. Um, but truly, we, we couldn't be more grateful for your partnership and, and think of a more fitting city than our home city um, to be the first ones to go Orange for Hunger Action Month. So thank you all. Um, we appreciate everything and we look forward to continue working with you. All right. Thank you so much, uh, Sari. Uh, I do have one question for you is um, I know that you merged with the Community Caring Center. And so I was hoping to learn if uh, a culinary incubator is in the works now that you have your uh, kitchen up and running. All of our initial plans are still in the works. We unfortunately have been a little delayed um, for what I think are obvious reasons. Um, so the next uh, priority area of focus for us is absolutely the culinary training program. We're still on track to have a 16 week curriculum with job placement. Um, we will look to launch that probably uh, mid-October and then the incubator component um, will follow. We just have to figure out what that's gonna look like in light of uh, our new normal, as they say. Yes, and thank you so much. And I just want to make sure that everybody knows that uh, Feeding South Florida off of Park Ridge Rose has a pantry. Um, so if you are ever desperate and need food uh, during working hours, um, give them a call ahead of time uh, to let them know you're on your way to pick up some food at the pantry. Right. Is there any other questions or comments? If not, Move on to the next announcement, which is Tuesday, September 8th at 5.30 p.m. We'll have our first public budget hearing to adopt the proposed budget and to adopt the final fire assessment rate resolution. Virtual access via GoToWebinar in person at City Hall Community Room. Capacity is limited to 10 attendees. And so um, I just want to make that note that we can change, update our Facebook event to let the people know that it is uh, that we do have capacity for people to come in uh, to the community room. And uh, I know, Laura, you've you shared with us uh, the updates from the state regarding the, the sales tax and other revenues. Do you mind letting the, the public know as well? Absolutely, Mayor. Um, so we, you know, with, with COVID, we anticipated and um, have been working closely with the state that provides what will be our state shared revenues and state sales tax. They convey that those funds to us. Um, each year, they give us an estimate of what we anticipate collecting the following fiscal year for our fiscal year, October 1 to September 30. So we received our estimations last week, and you've probably also seen a few news articles. Uh, Wellington and West Palm had, had an article in the paper over the weekend 
with their estimations coming in. And we we've, we've um, we're going to look at a we're going to see about a 1.2 million dollar shortfall in what we anticipate as a, a portion of our sales tax revenue as well as a portion of our state share revenue. The sales tax revenue was reduced by almost $900,000. And our shared revenues, which is a, a bundle of different types of revenues collected by the state that we get portions of, um, were, was reduced by about 300,000. So I will um, be bringing, you know, we, we had a balanced budget. Now I have a $1.2 million hole. So we've made a couple of adjustments and have some recommendations to bring to the commission for our first hearing on September 8, um, and possibly utilizing some, um, undesignated fund balance to to make up for that hole and make some adjustments in what we initially proposed to the commission in our July workshop. So we'll have that discussion September 8. Uh, you know, we that's not great. It's not horrible. We we did better, you know, we fared better than some other cities. You know, West Palm's taken a well over $10 million hit. They're talking layoffs. Um, we're not we're not at that point to have to do that. And then we monitor closely what we may be facing the following year as we go into our budget starting literally next April of what we may be facing the next year out. But, uh, you know, it could have been a lot worse, but yeah. we're, that's, we did get that and we'll talk about that a little bit more on September 8th. Okay. And, uh, you know, I'd also like to note to our residents of Boynton Beach that, you know, the, our different retailers are making it safe to go shopping. Um, my wife told me how, yeah. Great, she had an experience she had at Marshall's not shopping for five months and then going there. So um, make sure, you know, that if, uh, you know, if you need to go out and do something, uh, the locations here in Boynton Beach are doing what they can to stay safe. Yep. Our next uh, announcement is that the regular commission meeting on Tuesday, September 15, 2020 will be uh, at 5.30 p.m. And that Tuesday, September 22nd at 5.30, we will have our second public budget hearing to adopt the final millage rate and final budget. Um, we are not able to do this on our regularly scheduled meeting dates because of conflicting county and state organizations that also are using this date. Next, we'll open up to public audience. Individual speakers will be limited to three minute presentations. Please state your name and record, uh, name and address for the record. And if you'd like to speak on items for a uh, consent agenda or other types of the agenda, please let us know now so that we can make sure uh, we open up questions and hand raise at that time. So John, I'll ask you to open the, the hand raise and questions. Yes, Mayor Grant, uh, those options have been enabled. And as a reminder for anybody who wishes to participate, you can either click on the, the little hand icon on the side of the GoToWebinar interface or click on the question section and type your question at that point. Okay. All right. Uh, I see Susan Oyer has her hand raised. Uh, Hi. Susan, you are unmuted. Can everyone hear me okay? Yes, we can. Okay, Susan Oyer, 140 Southeast 27th Way. First of all, I want to say I've been out at the cemetery putting some flowers in and noticed that there are several um, monuments that are in disarray. And I'm hoping it's just because they were built, taking out the pavement and filling it in. But it was quite disturbing to see probably close to a dozen monuments knocked down on the ground, askance. Um, I've sent pictures to Vice Mayor Pinserga. Um, I discussed this the other day, but I certainly hope this is going to get resolved and the cemetery will be brought back to its normal shining glory very, very soon. And it seems like um, you wouldn't just take off for the weekend, leaving monuments askance up and down an entire two rows knowing that people come out on the weekends to see their loved ones. So I, I never normally have a problem with the cemetery. I think those guys do a fabulous job, but I was surprised and shocked to see the state of this. Um, there's also a big wood piece of wood, like plywood sitting in the middle 
over near, I want to say it's one of the Dubois um, grades. So that surprised me as well. So hopefully we can get something done about this before people go out there and have a, an absolute cow. Um, second of all, I want to say the police department, thank you for arresting all those drug dealers. Please come arrest some more. Um, I would encourage you to take a look at all the um, duplexes up and down by Betty Thomas Park and make between code and the police department, they can start removing some of these um, repeat offenders and you know, encourage them to move to some other city or stop their chosen profession, one or the other. Um, I would also want to bring forth, um, we need to be enforcing the state and city rules on electric car chargers. Um, we have them in the city. Um, I work at a building that has one. The sign, hopefully the sign will be getting posted soon because apparently the um, other employees don't believe that they're not allowed to park there. But I would encourage code and, the, and parking enforcement to start ticketing these people around the city who are parking in electric car charger spots. Because if you look at the codes, and Adam Temple was kind enough to send me the state statutes as well as the city ordinances. Um, it's actually a fine. It's similar to a handicapped parking space. And here's a great fundraiser for the city, at least in the short run. So I would, you know, of course say give out a warning first, but it, it seems like maybe we should be following the letter of the law ourselves by enforcing the car, char, electric car charger space requirements. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Ms. Sawyer. All right. Um, next, we have Ken Stevens, Jr. You have been unmuted by me. Are you there, um, Mr. Hello. Stevens? I'm here. All right. Thank you for uh, welcoming me here, uh, Mayor Grant. Uh, but I called you twice. I left you a voicemail, no answer or call back. Um, and in my book, no response is a response. And you showed the black community of Boynton Beach, you don't care about them by challenging me here to show up. When I pointed out there was a derogatory social media post and I called for the firing of Stephanie Slater, who is an experienced media person who also worked for Palm Beach Post. And she accidentally liked the post calling those 17 people that were arrested garbage in the social media post. And it's not the first time she's done something that's been highly questionable all right, when it's coming to people in the black community. All right, but Chief Gregory, Justin Katz, Christina Ramellis, I appreciate all of you for the fruitful conversations that we had and, um, you know, implementing change. We're trying to implement change. And funny enough with uh, Chief Gregory, we, we were on the phone for 42 minutes. We argued probably 30 of those back and forth, but we ended the conversation by agreeing to disagree. And that was something that I was very grateful for. And he also took action all right, to implement new social media posting policies that will make a change and not perpetuate that you don't care about the black community. All right, because I understand policing and doing their job, which I'm not praising drug dealers, but when you condemn people that are innocent until proven guilty, that shows what you really care about and challenge someone to show up to a meeting when you could have just reached out as well as others did in my inbox, which was very honorable and I appreciate that. And I'll leave you with this. Um, like the Honorable Louis Minister Farrakhan said, you don't have to condemn a dirty glass of water, just sit a clean one next to it. And when the people get thirsty, they'll know what glass to drink from. And if you don't clean your glass, the people will never drink from. I know this is your last term, but this is not the time to be beating on your chest while you're in that chair and perpetuating that you do not care about the black community. Your comments matter. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Stevens. And uh, in response, you know, I saw the the comment and you know it, there was a perception because there was a lot of drugs that the the police took off the streets there was a lot of guns that the police took off the streets and I consider that garbage and now I understand excuse me and I understand that there were other comments I don't think there was anything outward racist or hate speech but the perception of it is where the equity training needs to happen where correct the the, the police department is I think is doing a great job letting us know of them catching the criminals off the street. But this goes back to the bigger conversation, how we should really affect the city is that nobody was arrested for buying drugs. So 
the, the fact is, is that we've had multiple drug busts in the city of Boynton Beach, but none of them are going after the, the drug buyers. We're only going after the drug dealers. And so we need to send a message to the people who want to buy drugs in our city that that's also illegal. And so, you know, I believe, you know, we are going to have a conversation to change. I did not really appreciate the, the call Sunday morning. Um, and so I'm glad that you were able to be here and I'm able to speak with you. And I, I look forward to having a conversation with you shortly. But that's kind of where I'm at is that it's a conversation of the city because as you mentioned, 18 people who may be residents of Boynton Beach did something wrong and we need to help them put their life on the right track. And so I, you know, I hopefully we can figure that out. And uh, I think one of the ways that we can do that is by using the, the state statute that allows for community service to pay off any money owed to the state. And so that we can work together with our nonprofits to help make a better Boynton Beach. So thank you, Mr. Stevens for coming here. Uh, thank you. Uh, next, we have uh, Bonnie Miskell. It states that you're self-muted. Uh, good evening, Mr. Mayor. Actually, that's for item 9B. Okay. I, I have you on there noted, so if you want to lower your hand, I'll go on to the next person. Now, our next person is Lois Smith. You have been unmuted. Ms. Smith, are you able to hear us? Or Dr. Smith? I can hear you, but can you hear me? I can hear you now. Okay. Uh, I'm Dr. Lois Smith. I live on 122 Northwest 8th Avenue, Boynton. Um, I have submitted a concern with the clerk uh, to read. However, since I'm on, FPNL has uh, not fulfilled a request from the city code of compliance, Habitat for Humanity, and the city development manager, uh, which they all recommended that FPNL trim the overgrown trees over wires connected to the homes in our area. During the lightning, thunder, and the heavy rains, it is a very dangerous situation that's uh, compounding. Please give the underserved community the proper attention to uh, those who uh, consistently on time pay their utilities uh, on a regular basis. And we also have a light that is uh, around the area which should be illuminating over properties in the area of the overgrown trees. So I would like someone to uh, help us get something done in this area uh, regarding the overgrown trees. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Dr. Smith. And can I get that street again? This is uh, in the area, it's uh, basically in several areas. Uh, First Street and 8th Avenue, 33435, north. yes. No, no, northwest. Northwest, south, northwest First Street and 8th Avenue? Yes, it's a, it's in the cat corner uh, okay. where the Ocean Breeze West uh, apartments are located. All right, thank you and so much. And there are overgrown, uh, overgrown vegetation all along the fence of the um, the Breeze West uh, okay. that we've uh, you know requested on many occasions to get cleared up. I'll go speak to um, Sophia Eccleston, the, the government liaison for FPL, and see if we can't get an answer uh, soon. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you. All right. I don't believe I see anyone new raising their hands or asking a question, so I'm going to turn it over to our podium here at the community room. Hello, I'm Daryl Sanders. Uh, I represent uh, Chevy DTD Foundation, a um, nonprofit. We actually do uh, weekly meetings with um, the mayor here in Point Beach, uh, acknowledging local businesses, announcements for the city, 
And this Friday, we happen to be doing our meeting for the mayor in Delray Beach. Um, being is, we received um, 150 pre stuff uh, book bags from Parks and Recreation, City of Delray Beach, uh, Delray Beach Police Department, Delray Beach Citizens for Delray Police, their fire rescue, and also Delray Beach Neighborhood and Community Services. Um, I'm just wondering why I have to get 150 pre-packed book bags from the city of Delray Beach and I don't have anything from the city of Boynton Beach for the students for this, this school year or for, um, you know, programs for the kids to have to help them out pretty much for incentives for school and the summer programs or anything like that. So I would like to um, suggest that we come up with some kind of collaborative effort to assist our kids as well. It's like we're feeding families and we're, we're keeping the streets safe. We also need to look out for our um, our local kids to make sure that they don't come up and be drug dealers or be in the streets. So we got, I think we need to get more involved with the kids, with the fire department, police department, and just give them um, incentives and let them know we're here for them. Um, I think we need to pay more attention to our youth in the city as well. So that's what I have to say. Thank you. All right. Don't believe we have anyone else to speak. If so, we will close public audience and move on to administrative. We have, uh, to begin with, we have one uh, applicant for the Arts Commission, uh, Commissioner Katz, you have the, the nomination? Yes, um, I'll nominate Ace Tilton Ratcliffe. Do I hear a second? Commissioner Hay, if you want to raise a second, you raise your hand, thank you. Got it. So a second from Commissioner Hay. All those in favor, state so by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Hearing none, motion passes unanimously. We have two regular positions and one alternate position for the Building Board of Adjustments and Appeals. And we have three applicants for two positions on the Education and Youth Advisory Board. Um, Commissioner Hay, are you able to choose an applicant? Yes. Can you hear me? I yes. Am. Okay. Uh, I you know, it's good to have uh, more applicants for a change uh, than positions. Uh, I'd like to uh, recommend Dr. Valerie uh, Verkow for that position. All right. Do I have a second? Second, Mayor. Thank you. All those in favor, state so by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Hearing none, uh, nomination is passed. Our next uh, commissioner, Romulus, do you have uh, an applicant you want to nominate? Mayor, I can't seem to open my Nova, so uh, can you tell me, tell me the names, please? There is uh, a Frando Patterson and Abby Murrell. Okay, I'd like to nominate Abby. Do I have a second? Second. All right. Seeing no further discussion, all those in favor state so by saying aye. 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 Any, any opposed? Hearing none, motion passes unanimously. Then we have two alternate positions available on the Historic Resources Preservation Board and two alternate and one regular available on the Library Board. And that is it for administration. Would someone like to move an item from consent agenda? For myself, I'd like to remove item G. Commissioner Hay? I'd like, I'd like to uh, pull uh, item A. Is there anything else? Hearing none. Item A, approve and authorize the acceptance of a FEMA 2020 assistance to firefighters grant to cover the cost of purchasing 
PPE and related supplies, including reimbursement to prevent, prepare, prepare for and respond to COVID-19. The total award under the grant is $151,131, uh, 137 from the federal funds and a 13,000 match from Boynton Beach funds. Okay. Um, I would just like for someone to um, explain in layman's terms uh, how this 151,000 plus uh, is spent. Will someone do that? Go ahead. Uh, Mayor Grant, am I un unmuted? I can hear you. Okay, thank you. It's Ray Carter, your fire chief for uh, for the record. Um, yeah, Commissioner okay. Hay, this, this grant comes from FEMA um, and it was a grant that was carved out of the normal assistance to firefighter funds that typically go to purchase gear, purchase equipment, things like that. Um, but they designated this specifically for COVID-19. Uh, and what we did, we applied for it. We were awarded or sent an award letter and you need to authorize and approve the acceptance of that. The way this works is any purchases that we made since January 1 of 2020 that go towards personal protective equipment for our firefighters and our workers um, that relate to COVID-19 protection can be reimbursed for. Uh, to date, we've spent approximately $50,000 on uh, personal protective equipment, um, uh, sanitizing equipment, masks, gowns, face shields, things of that nature um, as we've done our responses out there in the community. So all but $17,000 of that will be, or I'm sorry, $13,000 of that would be reimbursed. And then the remainder of the 151,000 total would be able to be spent over the next year until next September to buy additional protective equipment for our firefighters and our responders. Thank you, Chief Carter. Uh, motion to approve. Second. Thank you. All those in favor, state so by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Hearing none, motion passes unanimously. Item G, uh, proposed resolution number 20-090, approve and authorize the mayor to sign an amendment to Town Square Redevelopment Phase Two Service Agreement for additional consulting services to market and lease the innovation and cafe space in City Hall and the cafe space in the Cultural Center. Um, yeah, I had a meeting with the, the city manager and our economic development and strategy coordinator and this will help with the, the RFP, um, where the, the presentation that we uh, heard uh, two weeks ago. Um, and one of the things that I'd like to, to make sure is that we have an opportunity to speak with Avison and Young uh, in regards to our own individual thoughts um, of what we would want for the, the incubator, the cafe space. Um, and that's so that we, we include that, that they at least try to have a 15 minute conversation with us, if not more to discuss, um, because one of the consultant scopes of services, um, you know, Avis and Young is a international company. So I wanna make sure that our reach is international with uh, the $50,000 that we're spending, not just uh, Southern County of Palm Beach. So yeah, Mayor, Mayor, Mayor Colin Groff, Assistant City Manager. Uh, yeah, we talked uh, Avidson Young. Uh, Keith O'Donnell is is perfectly willing. He wants to reach out to you, so we'll make sure all of that's arranged while we're preparing the RFP. Okay, excellent. And so, may I have that motion to approve? So move. Second. All those in favor, state so by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Hearing none, motion passes unanimously. They have a motion to approve the remainder of the consent agenda. So moved. So moved. Second. All those in favor, state so by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Hearing none, motion passes unanimously. Consent bids and purchases over 100,000. We have a motion to approve. So moved. Thank you. 
All those in favor state so by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion passes unanimously. There are no items for public hearing. We will move on to the city manager's report. Item 9A, approved contribution of $55,000 to the Education Foundation of Palm Beach County for the purchase of Wi-Fi extenders and related equipment to assist Palm Beach County and the school district in providing Wi-Fi access to Boynton Beach families slash students. Stack recommends utilizing the 55,000 from the Community Enrichment Fund account of Christ Fellowship Church donations, leaving a balance of 80,000 in the account. James Gavrilis, Executive Director of the Education Foundation of Palm Beach County, will present more details of how the, this contribution, along with a local fundraising campaign to the city to match these dollars, will provide much needed funds to purchase Wi-Fi extenders for Boynton Beach residents and students in underserved communities. Mayor, um, before um, Mr. Gavrilos comes on, we just wanted to, this is a follow-up from your conversation at our last meeting that it was very evident that each each and every one of you were passionate about doing, doing something to assist in this um, digital uh, initiative and trying to help close the digital divide, which certainly exists in our community. Um, so we, you know, we get these the, the $25,000 a year from Christ Fellowship uh, that they very generously contribute to our community annually. And we have $135,000 in that fund. All their ask ever was is to make it, we, we want you to use the funds to make an impact on our underserved communities and help help those that need some, some help. So uh, in talking to our finance director, we think this is a great use of, of this funding to be able to make the donation and go out and challenge the rest of our community for a local matching campaign. Um, we've included this information in our city newsletter. And I know um, as far as the Education Foundation's uh, current campaign where people can go on and contribute to purchase a Wi-Fi extender and sponsor a student in the Boynton Beach community. And you can specifically identify their Boynton Beach students. And I know we've had several residents already, including the mayor, already go on to the Education Foundation's website and make a contribution. So um, we would love your support to, to do this. And James, if you can talk a little bit more detail of the um, how, where this funding will specifically go, I would love you to. Uh, and I, I think, John, you'll have to let him probably unmute him. Um, Mr. Mr. Gavrilos, uh, your audio has been unmuted. Yes, sir. So um, good, good evening, uh, members of the city co uh, commission and also uh, city manager. Um, hopefully you can hear me. Just someone give me a thumbs up if you're hearing my voice. Perfect. As I drive around town, I'm used to people showing me a finger, not often the thumb, but thank you for that. I appreciate that. <laughs> you know, Tip O'Neill once said that all politics are local and um, nowhere has this ever been more evident than with the speed with which you as a as a city have responded to this. And, and let me just say, as someone who has worked with governments, both during my time at Boca Helping Hands, and certainly now with the Education Foundation, um, all credit to this amazing city of Boynton Beach, uh, which is also, by the way, where the Education Foundation is headquartered. Um, credit to you as the commission, as the mayor, as a city manager, but credit for, for caring, and not just caring, but wanting to do something. Now, lest we think this is um, a minor issue or one localized here in Boynton Beach, I suspect many of you have seen a picture which has gone viral in the last week of two young children out in California sitting at a Taco Bell in the parking lot doing their schoolwork because that's the only way they could access Wi-Fi internet. I don't even know what to say to that anymore. I don't know. I don't know as Americans how we can look at that and not ask ourselves where did we get so far off track. And so two weeks ago we shared with you the vision of where we're going with this plan for what we call digital inclusion. And there really is a short term reality and then a long term reality. The short term reality is this. There are 5,594 students in the Palm Beach County School District who reside in the Boynton Beach city limits. So let's round it up to basically 5,600. Of those 5,600 students, roughly 4,559 of them 
are on a free or reduced lunch program, which means they're living below the poverty level. Statistically, it has been shown time and again, families who are living below the poverty level, more often than not, do not have internet access. They're simply just not able to pay for, they can't buy food. They certainly can't provide internet access. Our friends at the Quantum Foundation with whom we're working on this project have done uh, some exhaustive studies and the conclusion I don't think is anything that's going to shock us, but hearing it put this bluntly might. Families who do not have internet access typically have lower graduation rates. Over a lifetime, they earn less money. And quite honestly, ladies and gentlemen, they have lower life expectancy. Let me just be very clear on this. Families who grow up today without internet access earn less, learn less, and live less. There's simply no way around those, what John Adams would call inconvenient facts. And so all credit to Boynton Beach for saying, let's get something done. Of those 4,559 students who are on a free or reduced lunch, and I remind you, these are students within the Boynton Beach city limit. The Wi-Fi mesh program that we described two weeks ago would cover approximately 2,400 of them, really covering, uh, the expectation is to cover 2,700 students. Now, that's the good news, that with your support, we can cover 2,700 students and obviously their families as well. Now, I'm still talking about the short-term ramifications of this project. We can get them connected so they can begin their studies. The obvious question is, well, what about the other 1,800 students? On the short term, they are going to be served by the Wi-Fi hotspot program, as well as the Internet Essentials program that we discussed two weeks ago. There have been companies and, and, and uh, charities in town who have purchased the hotspots. Uh, the school district has even outfitted some of its buses with hotspots and kind of spread them around the county. And then the district itself is picking up the cost for the Internet Essentials, which is $9.95 a month. The district will pick up six months to ensure that the young people do have some access to get their lessons done. But what we're looking at here, we call digital inclusion. This is about much more than getting our kids through the next few weeks. This is bringing internet access to 2,700 families right here in Boynton Beach and giving them an opportunity, a share of the American dream. As I shared with you two weeks ago, internet today is what electricity was 100 years ago. If you don't have the internet today, you simply can't function. You, you can't participate in, in, in the modern culture. You can't apply for jobs. You can't do telemedicine. You can't apply for food stamps, et cetera. And so our plan is for digital inclusion. So to sum up, of the 5,594 students in Boynton Beach, roughly 4,560 of them are living at or below the poverty level. The phase that we are addressing uh, with this internet inclusion program would cover roughly 2,700 of them. What we are looking to do is purchase Wi-Fi extender boxes. There is a range of $35 all the way to $75. So let's split the difference and say $55. Um, for about $135,000, we can get Wi-Fi extenders to every one of those 2,700 families, giving them internet access for the foreseeable future. They, they say the boxes are good for roughly five years. I've had the same router box here for 12 years. I mean, the boxes will last as long as they last. So this really is a long-term solution. When I met with your city manager and some of their team, I proposed something. I love matching campaigns. And I think quite honestly, so do many people. If the city approves uh, this incredibly generous grant, I would love to go to the city of Boynton Beach, to your citizens, to your business community and say, let's match it. If the city puts up 55,000, let's match it with 55,000 and make it 110 and cover almost all of those um, 2,700 children. And quite honestly, Boynton Beach, I wanna use you to nudge some of our neighbors, perhaps to the south and a few of our neighbors to the north to say, look what Boynton Beach just did. Oh, I'm just gonna go ahead and say it, Mayor Grant. Come on, Boca Raton, come on, Delray. Let's go to Palm Beach Gardens, Jupiter, and a few other places. Boynton Beach did it. They're leading the, the charge. They're setting the standard. We need to follow their lead. So this has the potential to have an enormous impact right here in Boynton Beach and certainly throughout the county. Um, 
that's where we stand today. I think that's what the uh, the extenders, uh, as I said, the Wi-Fi extender, uh, the cost is. This is going to be the immediate impact to uh, the city of Boynton Beach, and I think using you as an impetus and a motivation for the rest of Palm Beach County to respond as quickly, as efficiently, and as generously as you have. I will pause here and take some questions or comments if you have. Um, Jim, uh, I want to th thank you again for coming here. Um, you know, I, I really do appreciate it and I hopefully uh, we can get our residents here to see the importance of getting internet uh, to all of our residents here because I ask people, are you on the, are the city's weekly uh, email blast? And they say no. I said, okay, well you have to join because that's how we're sending out our information. Um, Eleanor, uh, our director of marketing, showed me what the city used to do in the, I think the 1980s or 70s with the, the Boynton Forum uh, or Boynton Bulletin, that's what it was called, of all the things that were going on in the city. And so we, we've come a long way from paper newspapers and that includes uh, the electronic uh, mail. And so I'm hoping that we can get um, not just our businesses, but our associations, um, Leisureville, Inca, Big, uh, to help chip in Hunter's Run so that we can really make it the, the difference so that we can say that no, you know, <laughs> no child ha doesn't have internet. All children have internet here in the city. Children and their families, Mayor, thank you for that. And the Ed Foundation, we're prepared to come in and really do everything we can to help that matching campaign uh, bear fruit. Mayor, also, um, in addition to the 55, our utility is required with our consumptive use permit to spend a certain dollar amount on education, um, conservation and just utility education related stuff with, with students. And we really um, have really had a hard time spending the dollars this year because of school being closed. We usually go in, we have coloring book kits and do things to teach the kids, but we, we got creative and with school obviously being virtual, um, we have until the end of September, we have $20,000 left in this education portion that we, we need to spend. So we would love to add that to it. There is a, a good rational nexus of um, internet access and education to be able to get information to our students in our community. So it would be 75,000 from the city with hopefully matching up to 75 by our community and be able to contribute a total of 150. Mm. Commissioner Hay. Uh, yes, I just wanted to say that uh, this this is very exciting uh, to hear what we're doing. Uh, we are definitely a good, a good team and, and a role model for the rest of the cities. But I just wanted to make sure, I, I, th I think we talked about this particular one last time. Uh, this is the uh, Wi-Fi extender that, that uh, was selected. And I just wanted to make sure that part of that education is for people to help families install it because it it, it, it could be challenging. And we just don't want to drop it uh, by their house, tell them to install it, and they, they end up not knowing how to do that. So I just wanted to make sure, uh, James, that part of part of that package is is the uh, installation of the uh, the Wi-Fi extender. Is that is that is that correct? Yes, sir, Commissioner, that absolutely is correct. Um, our partners up at the Quantum Foundation are spearheading what we're calling the Navigators piece. And the, na the Navigators will actually be putting boots on the ground in local communities uh, to help people not only install, but troubleshoot. As I shared with you last time, and, and I inadvertently gave Justin about five or six children. Justin, let's give you a 10. What the heck? Uh, you know, most of us, when our Wi-Fi goes down, we, we just ask one of our kids to fix it. We're dealing with a population that's never had internet connectivity. Uh, they're not gonna know those skills. They just don't have them. And so, Commissioner, you are correct. The navigators will be going into the communities, having community meetings at different you know, community centers, churches, synagogues, wherever we can gather people and really walking them through the installation and also the ongoing maintenance issues. Very good, very good. Yes, Thank you. A walk through our city library right now you'll see numerous students i was down there today numerous uh high school students doing their schoolwork and doing their online learning right from city hall because we have wi-fi yep wow yeah yeah it's obvious uh, many don't 
Excellent. So Excellent. if there isn't um, any other discussion, I'd like to get a, uh, a motion to approve. So motion to approve. All right, we got a, a move second. by Commissioner Katz, second by Commissioner Hay. Any further discussion? Motion. Yep. Yes. Just to clarify, what is the total amount that we're donating? 75,000. And so we'd like to do it as a, a matching. The 20 that Lori just mentioned? 55 from okay, our so we'll... community enrichment fund and then 20 from our water utility. Utility. Okay, thank you for the clarification. Um, and then just to, to follow up on Jim's request for doing a matching campaign, is that something that Eleanor will be taking up to help get our um, community partners on board? We all will. James is committed to assisting us with that, Commissioner. And yes, um, Eleanor will be certainly blasting it out through our our methods, but um, putting some of the materials together and working on the campaign, James is um, going to help us out. Wonderful. Wonder, wonderful. Let me know how I can how I can help. Thank you. All right. Definitely. Seeing no further discussion, all those in favor state so by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Hearing none. Motion passes unanimously. I cannot thank you enough for your boldness, for your vision, for your compassion. And above all, for your leadership, Brighton Beach is going to lead Palm Beach County into this amazing project. Uh, way to go, Brighton Beach. Thank you. Our next item is 9BV, provide an update on the private development progress for the Town Square project and discuss the letter provided to the city by JKM developers on potential contract amendments. Thank you, Mayor. Um, we we received, well, last meeting you had requested that um, JKM, John Markey, uh, our private development partner in our Town Square project provide, there were some discussions of doing some things differently. So you had asked John to provide um, effectively a marked up development agreement of what his thoughts and ideas were on, on how to potentially restructure our deal a little bit. Um, we received a memorandum from him midweek last week, I think. And I went ahead and sent that out to you. Uh, it, it, John, and I think I'm sure John's on the call if we want to have him talk. Um, we met, well, Zoom on, I think last Thursday or Friday, uh, discussed briefly the content of the memo. I, I, I know we had requested something different. You were looking for a marked up agreement. I think, um, you know, he wasn't, didn't feel we were, he was quite at the point to maybe get there to, without some further discussion. So. Um, with that, I don't know if Jim has anything to add, but uh, your opportunity to to talk about it, chat about it, and tell us what you think about it. All right. Uh, Jim, do you have anything to add? I do not, Mayor. I think the uh, backup in the agenda and Lori's introductory comments uh, tells you where you are for commission discussion purposes. Okay. Does the commission have any comments, or we'd like to hear the presentation first? Mayor, I have some comments. Okay. Thank you. Um, so, so first, I'll draw a parallel real quick to a lesson we probably learned from the last CRA board meeting, which is uh, when we have a specific item or if someone submits a letter, I think that it's imperative that as an elected body, we start discussing the matter before any party presents anything that, that hasn't been reviewed. I think that's a lesson, again, we, we could learn from the last CRA meeting with regards to a presentation which was given before it was really discussed amongst us. So personally, my my thoughts on this, we made uh, a request for a partner on Town Square to submit a letter to the city outlining their proposals relative to, to how they plan to complete a project according to the, the contract we have or what types of changes they would like to see uh, in the contract based on their their wishes. So we do have that letter uh, in our possession. It's in the backup. I know a presentation has been made, but I'd, I'd like to discuss it as a board personally first before the presentation because that wasn't what I was expecting. So I'll, I'll open up. Um, my, my position remains the same. I, I think we have a contract. I think that the city has upheld its end of the contract and I am only looking for the other partners 
uh, to uphold their end of the contract. I don't, in, in perusing the, the letter that was submitted and some of the uh, requests and some of the changes that, that might be added um, per the, the partner on this project, I, I can't personally see doubling down when the issues of, of not moving forward according to a time frame that we had expected or not securing finances to do the project there's no evidence that what's already in the contract can be fulfilled. So any requests for millions of dollars in additional taxpayer funds to me is, is a non-starter. I just, I, my personal opinion is there are two options available to us. One is to hear from the applicant here, not the applicant, but our partner, JKM, either they can comply with the terms of the existing contract or they cannot. And if they cannot, then it's a decision for us to see how to proceed. But I, I, my view, if, if the terms of the contract cannot be fulfilled, I do not intend to invest further in this partnership. I want to find an amicable resolution so that we can move forward and complete this. I just, you know, I can't say it enough, so I'll say it one more time and stop talking. I don't see how we can double down and put millions more dollars of the taxpayers' money into a partnership that to date appears to be floundering at best. So, so that's where I'm at. I appreciate the, the content that was delivered by JKM, but I just, I see a lot of bells and whistles trying to dress up a bad situation without actually addressing the bad situation. That's all my comments for now. Commissioner Katz, uh, thank you for you know, us for your position on it. Um, you know, my position is, is that it's not current taxpayer money. This is taxpayer money for the project that's going to be built. And the current project or the current contract doesn't allow for scholarship trust fund, does not allow for workforce housing. So if we have an opportunity to renegotiate the contract to make things better, because we understand that things have changed. I'm in for getting a better deal than we originally gotten, if that's possible. Because, correct, if we spend more money, we're likely to get a better project. Um, and we've had times in the past where we've tried to get incentivized development to happen, and it has not. And there's times where we didn't incentivize development to happen, and it has occurred. So I'm looking to make a better Boynton Beach and if we have any way to do it, I'm moving forward with that direction. So um, I believe the JKM had wanted to do a screen share to allow them to have their presentation. Is that uh, correct? Uh, yeah, this is John McNally. I do, I do have a presentation ready to go if the board would like to see that. I'd like to see it. Okay, just a second. <clears throat> Good evening, Mr. Mayor. Uh, for the record, John Markey, am, am I, can you see me? Am I, am I being heard? You are being heard, we cannot see you. Okay, is, is, the, is the presentation being seen? It is currently being seen. You're on the, the first page, Boynton Town Square. Great. Well, I, I, I'm not going to address Commissioner Katz directly because I think, you know, through this presentation, I hope we answer a lot of his questions. Um, I want to speak directly to, you know, our agreement, our contract. I have been in this business for 40 years. I've been a party to hundreds of contracts, and I always prefer to look at those contracts as rather than something binding, something that we remember what it is we agreed to and what we said. And that's the situation I'm gonna to speak to you about this evening with this contract. And I wanna remind the commission that this contract was negotiated with everyone on the city staff for a period of two months. It was thoroughly vetted by the city attorney. It's a good document. Um, if I could get you to go to the next slide, John, that'd be great. So this is just an excerpt from the developer's agreement. When we negotiated this deal, we knew it was impossible for any private sector developer, not just JKM, 
to finish the garage at the same time as the city hall. Could not happen. So we documented that on the public record in this contract. And if you look at that first paragraph, it says 18 months after the date of CO of City Hall. So for people to go around and ask at this point in time, why isn't the garage done? When we knew from the very beginning and we documented it, that it was not going to happen that way, it, 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 it baffles me. If you could go to the next slide, John, please. So not only did we know it and put it in this contract and we were all aware of it, but evidently we forgot what it is we said and we agreed to. We codified it in the master plan. There's no ambiguity when you look at this plan and it says phase two, phase 3A, phase 3B, phase four. We always knew what the sequence was going to be when we first started this project. So, you know, we're at a point here where I'm bringing solutions, but I have to tell you what it is we did and how it is we got here. It's essential that we understand how we got here to understand how we solve this problem. So I, I want to go all the way back to day one, which is our RFP presentation, where I laid out for the city in that presentation on the record and on videotape, you can go back and look at it, that we were proposing to use TIF financing for this project and we were proposing to buy the land that the city you know, was going to sell us for the apartment buildings. And we were proposing to underwrite the entire project, including the garages with TIF financing and those income funds from us buying the land. Believe me, I wish it had gone that way. So we did win the RFP. We were going down the road in my firm of underwriting that. Oh, and I forgot to mention that the city's RFP said that a developer could propose to use TIF. So from the very beginning, your staff knew and conceived this RFP to use TIF funding to build this project. So after winning the RFP, we're going down the road in my firm of underwriting that TIF to build the entire project, the entire municipal part of the project, along with income from us buying the land. We had proposed that the bond issuance would be done by a community development district that the city would form. And those bonds would be issued based on leveraging the TIF, the tax increment that would be created. Um, I know I'm getting into this, but you know, uh, the, the details of TIF, but it's essential that we all understand that. So that's what we proposed from day one. After underwriting that for several months, it was decided that uh, an, a nonprofit could issue the bonds faster, and that was essential to the timing. And that was a good decision because a nonprofit could get the bonds issued faster than we could form a CDD and do a preliminary offering and issue the bonds. Good decision. At that point, E2L and CFP took over the underwriting and went about uh, the bond preliminary offering. So we go down that road and after about two months of that, Mark Heffern comes to me and he says, we can't underwrite the garages. We can't underwrite the cost of the garages. The entire project is in, prob in a, a danger of not happening because we can't underwrite the garages. Is there anything we can do? Is there anything we can figure out? So at that point, I got together with my staff and we brainstormed under the auspices of trying to save this project. We came up with this plan whereby we could underwrite the garages as a private developer if the land was left in the deal and the city would prepay their parking obligation. That would make it possible to underwrite. We can still do that. As Commissioner Katz said, we can still perform that under the contract. But I don't think that's the best solution. You know, it became very evident that the timing was problematic for everybody. And we participated in how do we get this accelerated? How do we get the North Garage accelerated? How do we get the delivery of all the apartments, which are the tax base accelerated? We participated in all that. 
So we're going along and we did strike this deal where, okay, we're gonna build the, the garages as a private sector. Um, if I could have the next slide, John. Oh, this speaks to what we uh, spent to date. Uh, actually, John, I need slide five, please. Is it possible for you to zoom in a little bit centered on that green portion of the, the spreadsheet so people can see better? Great. So um, what happened was the bonds were issued based on the underwriting of <clears throat> E2L and, and CFP. So if you look at this chart, uh, I'm going to make it simple. What you see on the left-hand side is the city's document. That's public record. What you see in the green cells is what my team of experts have come up with based on 2,000 pages of documents that were released to us since my last appearance here by the city. So we have public record there, and I'm gonna to explain to you what we're looking at. It's very simple what the green cells are. It's simple arithmetic. If you look at the annual cost in the blue column of the city's chart, and you look at what the interlocal agreement from the city, the CRA provides, that's the $3.7 million, and you subtract what your costs are uh, or you subtract what your funds are, the 3.7, from what your costs are in the blue column, very simple arithmetic, you come up with a deficit. Now, the problem with that is there's no such thing as a deficit column in underwriting. The most basic tenant of underwriting is that capital in sources equal capital expenditures out. Sources in equal sources out. This is so far out of bounds, this deficit, that it's not even addressed. There's no such thing as a, a deficit column in underwriting. Now, I've been told by some folks that, well, the city always thought that they would get more income and more tax base and they would make up for the deficit. That's absolutely the worst possible answer that you could give. Because in responsible underwriting, what you do is you name what that source of funds is and you quantitative it, quantitatively describe it. You put it in the underwriting. Sources and uses, no such thing as a deficit column. So for the people who are not financial analysts or are not underwriters, I wanna put that into a layman's example. Imagine if you will, I walk into a bank and I say to the banker, I want a loan, but I know where I'm getting 70% of the money to pay that loan back to you, but the other 30% I'm gonna figure out somewhere down the road. Well, not only am I not gonna get that loan, I'm gonna get shown the door. Since my last appearance here, I put together a team of experts. I found the best municipal lawyers and municipal public funding lawyers that I could find, the best land use lawyers that I could find, and brought in the best tax advisory CPAs in the country that I could find. This column, these columns that are in green are a product of their doing. So when you look at that column in red, when they first, when my experts first saw that, and these are people who've been involved in billions of dollars of bond issuances, their jaws drop because there's no such thing. This is completely irresponsible underwriting. So it gets worse. It gets much worse. You know, it turns out if you look at those tax columns that say South tax, Central tax, North tax, all those columns are what's available from the tax increment of this uh, private sector alone. That's the 95% that goes to the CRA. It's net. And so when you look at what that totals, if you could scroll over a little bit, John, so we see that yellow cell on the, the far right. That's over $3 million annually. You look at the size of the deficit, it's going from roughly $784,000 to almost a million and a half dollars annually deficit. It wasn't underwritten. 
if you look at that number, that's the amount of tax increment that's available. So what that means is it all along could have underwritten the garages. So I feel angry that I was duped into a situation where I had to take responsibility for building these garages in the private sector. When that wasn't the situation, that never needed to be done and it was done under false pretense. Mayor. What should yes. make this commission extremely mad, fighting mad, is if you look at that yellow cell that says $3 million, what that means is the original bond could have underwritten the construction of the garages built by the city. They would have been built concurrently with City Hall. They would have been finished before City Hall. You could have had both garages and that didn't happen. So you know, I'm mad about it. The Citizens city commission five. should be fighting mad about it. What was that, Mayor? I'll let, I'll let the presenter finish the slide and then I'll allow you to ask a question or comment. Okay. So, Mr. Mark, so are you thank you for letting me, so thank you for letting me finish. I know it's an, a bit of an involved story. So you say to me, you know, how does this happen? Why does this happen? I can't tell you whether it's incompetence or whether it is calculated. What I can tell you in a bond issuance, there are a number of people who get paid when the bond is issued. They have no motive other than to get a bond issuance done. So I'm telling you that there are a number of people that did not care whether or not this project could be underwritten and paid for correctly. All they cared about was that your signature as the city was on those bonds. That's the only reason they sold. They were not underwritten correctly. I can tell you as someone who has dealt with many, many bond buyers and has done more than $200 million of bond issuances in public finance, that the bond buyers do not care whether or not we've accounted for and underwritten our project carefully, all they care about is that your signature is on that bond and they've got you on the hook. Absolutely, that's all they care about. So we end up in a situation where you've been duped into a situation where you could have had your garages underwritten the way they should have been. I was duped into becoming responsible for something that I never wanted to do. Believe me, I wish that I had bought this land and was building these apartments uh, and the whole project was underwritten correctly. So that's, a, that's where we find ourselves now. In my proposal that I'm making, which I asked for a continuance because my team has not completely finalized that, but what you see here is quite, quite revealing. What I'm proposing now is we go back to what I said we should do on day one in that presentation. We use, we leverage the TIF increment, we leverage that future tax to finance some bonds to get this done the way it always should have been. And that's what I proposed in my memorandum, in short. Thank you. Commissioner Ramos, you said uh, you have a question or comment? Uh, is is the presenter finished? I'll just wait till he's finished because I, I I'd rather not. I'm, okay. I'm finished. I'm finished, Christina. If you want. Uh, uh, if you want to she, she was asking if you're finished the presentation or the slide. Uh, the, I'm finished with the presentation unless there are more questions. Mayor, okay. I have a, a comment. If well, we're going to let Commissioner Romulus go first. M Mayor. Um, <laughs> Okay, so I'm I'm just I'm at a, a loss here because again this seems to be kind of like the overarching theme that you know we don't know what we don't know and then all of a sudden we're blindsided with well this is what's been going on and and I wish you had known and and it it really just gives me this pause because I have to then ask okay this three million dollar shortfall or this deficit that we're seeing here why are we just now hearing about it now why are we just now hearing that this you know the, these these parking garages that were supposed to be done initially by one party were transferred over to another party and it was taken on and if it was taken on there should have been realization that it should have been able to be done otherwise it shouldn't have been taken on but now that it's 
several months later and a product has not been delivered, now all of a sudden we're hearing that it should have never been taken on and there, this is the problem, this is why it can't be delivered and this is why we need to solve it right here, right now. I, I, I am, I don't have words to explain my frustration in terms of saying, why is it that now it's now that we're hearing of this and it's now that this problem is being addressed and it's now that it's being brought up to our attention. And if all these issues were going on and if all these underwriting issues were questionable, why is it now that we're hearing of it? I, I don't understand, John. And I, you know, I, I hope you can hear the frustration in my voice because I can't hide it anymore. It's, 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 this is insane. I don't understand this. So it, it's for me, it's one of two things. I'm going to be blatant and just 100% frank here. It's either one, this is complete BS and we're just getting whatever it is from you just because this is the best you can do to kind of make up for whatever's happened in the past. Or this, there's some truth to this and everybody has been lying. So it, it's hard for me to kind of swallow both of those things. But I mean, this is the discussion that we're having now. This is where we are. And I'd like to get to the bottom of this because for me, frankly, I, I'm, I'm at my wits end with all this. And I have to agree with what uh, Commissioner Katz said at the beginning, which is, you know, at this point, it just feels like we just need to cut, cut our losses and just scrap all this and, and start over. Because I, I, I don't understand why, if all these problems have been happening since the beginning, they were never brought to our attention until we are finally at this point, we had to ask for some type of renegotiation to happen or some type of conversation to restart in order for us to finally see all these things that have been quote unquote happening behind the scenes. And it's now all of a sudden that it's our problem to fix it. I, I, I do not understand, I do not comprehend. And, and frankly, I, I am just at a loss. So I, I, I don't see a reason to want to continue or double down or really continue down this rabbit hole because for me it just feels like a waste of time and and frankly just <laughs> insulting to want to go down this path after all this and and if if we can't work with somebody who's going to be honest with us from the get go that can say these are the issues and tell us on day 1 that they're the issues rather than waiting until we are at our wits end and finally saying well these are the reasons why I haven't been able to deliver up until now it i i hope you can understand why i'm frustrated and and I, I can't even put my words together because I'm, I'm getting a little emotionally just like and ugh, right now. So either way, I'm 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 at my wit's end is the point of what I'm trying to say. And I am just ready to kind of throw the towel here and just say start over because this right here, right now, these numbers, this whole line of explanation of why we're here where we are now makes absolutely no sense to me. And to me, it just seems like complete BS. I can't take it. Mr. Mayor, may I address the commissioner's comments? I'm going to let uh, Commissioner Katz speak first because he asked to speak. Thank you, Mayor. And I guess I'll I'll bite my tongue. And it's really the first time I can think in in four years of being on this commission and three years of being the CTA president, seven years of elected office, and I've never bit my tongue before. But I don't feel comfortable continuing this conversation in lieu of the accusations were that were just made against our city staff. Um, I, I don't feel comfortable continuing. I've stated my piece. I think that if those accusations were just made, the word duped was used multiple times in reference to how our city staff conducted themselves. And if those things are true, then that, then that is a disaster unto itself that we would have to deal with. But I don't believe them to be true. And I, I, I'm not a lawyer, but I don't think it's legally prudent to have a discussion with a party who's made accusations about duping or, or fraudulent, you know, representation of situations. I just, I think that, that we should, my opinion is direct staff to lay out two options, complete the project as outlined in the contract or negotiate with the city on some amicable solution to sever this relationship. I don't think we should continue to talk and I don't think staff is in a position to even advise us publicly because they've just been accused of, of some gross misrepresentations, not just to the public, but to us as an elected body. This has become very uncomfortable to me, and I don't think legally it's advisable to continue forward in this discussion. Commissioner sure, Haig? Uh, yes, can you hear me? I can. Okay. okay. I don't want to go back over what uh, 
my cohorts have stated, uh, Commissioner Katz and uh, Commissioner uh, Romulus, but I totally agree with them. What I was hoping for tonight, uh, not being in on the original, um, I was hoping as I've done my research and I've talked with one of you, your staff that uh, that I would hear uh, something that would be uh, convincing a little bit more that that there could be the deliverable that uh, that we talked about. But um, based on what I've heard, uh, I too I, I, I'm not convinced. Uh, to, and to say that we need to go back to the beginning and talk. Tips, uh, dollars, and finance, and all that kind of stuff. I, that, that to me is, uh, is is not what what I was looking for. Um, I just think that uh, I don't I don't get a warm feeling here at all um, about what I'm hearing, and uh, I just assume. Uh, uh, I think I can't remember which one. I think it was uh, Commissioner Katz said that we need to just uh, find some uh, uh, happy medium here. And uh, and just uh, do what we can to, to to save the dollars. Sure, it's going to probably cost the city a few more dollars now to, if we were to uh, uh, sever our ties. But uh, I, I I don't feel comfortable going forward uh, down the road. We kicked that can uh, down the road long enough. And uh, it, uh, as far as I'm concerned, uh, it's, it's something that's it's going to be. Uh, and undeliverable, uh, no matter what. So, and it's going to be at at our expense to, uh, so some to a lot degree. So I, I don't feel comfortable with this at all. And I think we just need to sever our ties and uh, move on down the road. All right, uh, Vice Mayor, do you have any comments? Uh, yes, Mayor. Thank you. Um, you no, know, I walked into this meeting with a particular position. <laughs> And unfortunately, you know, from what I've heard from this presentation, uh, that position has not changed. And it's this. Many weeks ago, we heard a presentation from staff as to how much money has gone into this project in forms, in different forms of incentive. And, and in, we had that same PowerPoint. We all saw it. And between the three parcels, there was about $25 million uh, in various forms of incentives. And almost 2 million of that was direct cash to JKM. So the idea of doubling down is not gonna work for me. And at some point, um, it's very clear that this relationship, this working relationship is not working. And I think we've crossed that line. Um, and I wish this wasn't the case. And you know, I understand what he's saying, that there's um, a lot of problems in the past and should have done this and should have done that, but um, we have to, you know, hold the line. And frankly, uh, $25 million in incentives, almost $2 million in cash was too much for me. Now, I wasn't there in the beginning, but, you know, I wouldn't have been okay with that then. And I'm certainly not okay with it now or even adding more to it now. Either uh, the current contract is, um, you know, is fulfilled or we need to move on and terminate this relationship. And John uh, McNally, do you mind scrolling forward to uh, slide 10? Yes, sir. Uh, all right. Just a second. There we go. <clears throat> Mr. Mayor, may I address the commissioner's comments? Um, yes, you may. I I can address uh, Justin's comments and Christina's comments in the same answer. Um, I, I need to clarify. There's absolutely no accusation about staff um, misbehaving here. I know staff and I know that had they been aware of what I just presented, they certainly would have stopped it or they would have taken it a different direction. To answer Christina's portion of the question, I had to submit a freedom of information request to get these documents, to get 2,000 pages of documents. That happened only three weeks ago, Christina. 
we've been sifting through that 2,000 pages of documents to get to this point. I did not know this until the past week. So, you know, to think that we could come and tell you what happened and what went wrong and why it shouldn't happen and why it should go back to the way it was, which TIF has always been the anticipated answer. And I need to be clear about TIF. You know, the, the TIF that I'm talking about is only from the private sector taxes of this, this project. I'm not asking you to give it to me. I'm asking you to give it to the project. I'm not telling you to, to give it to me and I'll spend it. I don't want to touch it. I'm telling you what financial mechanism you have to get this project done in the best way. I'm not asking for help for me. I'm asking for help for us. Thank you, John. Um, you know, my comments are is that, you know, I have a finance degree, I am an attorney, so I may see these things a little bit differently. Uh, the fact of the, the matter is, is that the taxpayers is John. So when you're saying you don't feel comfortable spending John's future money, I don't, doesn't make sense to me because that's what TIF is, is the money that is generated to pay back the developer for the development. That's what we did with 500 Ocean. Casa Costa, Marina Village, Seaborn Cove. The difference is, is that this is what we're getting back from the tax incremental funding. For 500 Ocean, we requested commercial locations and with the help of few, uh, future CRA dollars for the economic development grants, we have commercial locations. I've been to the, the two restaurants, the, hair and na the nail and hair salon, the, spoke with the future owners of Pio Pio, and we're very excited. And so in order to remove slum and blight, this county and city agreed that, hey, we need to spend future tax dollars in this area. That's how this project was built. The whole town square is currently being funded on tax incremental funding because the city hasn't paid any money to, towards the bonds. It's all been the CRA. So for us to say that we don't want to spend future taxes to make a project better, that no, that doesn't necessarily make sense to me. The the fact that we have, you know, we can create guidelines that says, this is the contract, these are the deadlines. Otherwise, we want the original deal, which is possible. We can still get the original deal, but none of this will be included. And so the the question that we have to ask is that what's more important, the original deal or to try to renegotiate to get something better out of it. The, the fun fact that we have is that we don't own the land. So that $25 million that uh, the city um, put into the, the project, which we put into the project regardless. You know, it, it's kind of like the city wasn't building the, the garages. The city's not building the residences to increase the tax base. So, you know, I understand uh, the commission's sentiment and that's kind of where we have to decide is that do we want only the original deal and we have to deal with the legal jargon of 18 months from the certificate of occupancy and the effective date or are we going to say you know what the world has changed you know we are on in a new normal i am wearing a mask right now because I'm in the public meeting with the other people here and they're all wearing masks as well. So to think that, hey, two years ago, we knew exactly what was going to happen and everything was gonna go according to plan, that doesn't make sense to me. So absolutely, we can direct staff either way to say, you know what, we want to see what the options are available and the deadlines of the, the 18 months from the certificate of occupancy or we can say no we don't we want the original deal so i'll, I'll wait to hear from the the commission how we would like to move forward mayor yes so i i'll agree disagree on a lot uh, i respect everyone's position that's that's divergent from mine but uh my position right now is firm i'd like to to make a motion to direct staff to present one of two options, you know, to JKM, 
to communicate and explain how they plan to fulfill the contract as stated and previously negotiated, or to acknowledge what was stated, I think two meetings ago, that these deadlines, future deadlines, are not going to be met. It was already stated by our, our, by our partner here, JKM. So the motion is to acknowledge that you can and demonstrate how you plan to complete the project in accordance with the contract or acknowledge that you can't and start to discuss and negotiate with our city staff and our city legal how to unwind this, this partnership in a way that, that is respectful of all parties. That is my motion. Mr. Mayor? Yes. I'm sorry, it's Bonnie Miskell. Um, excuse me for interrupting, but I don't see the little hand raised thing. And I had also wanted to speak on that, if it's acceptable yes. to the commission. Yes, thank um, you for speaking up. Bon Bonnie Miskell, um, you know me. I've been recently retained by Mr. Markey as it relates to this particular um, discussion. And um, I, I haven't really had enough time to dig into it, and ha I don't have the knowledge that you all have. But the one thing that John asked us to do and asked me to do immediately upon um, being retained was to read the contract and understand the contract. So I did read the contract. And, and you know, he is currently in compliance with your contract. That's not the issue. But I think what John's trying to say is that there may be a better option for you to consider um, certainly, I understand what, what Commissioner Katz has just said, and those are clearly two options that you may avail yourself of. I'm not so sure I'm winding this as, as easy as you might think, but a third option is to consider if there is something better here. What John learned is that you are both duped, that, that what was not clearly presented to him by Mr. Heffernan um, a, a while back was certainly not presented to you either. And as he digged into the document or dug into the documents and reviewed the actual content of those documents, he realized that this was not the best deal for either of you. And as a good partner, he stepped in and he tried to solve it, but his solution of, uh, wasn't the best solution. So what you might consider as a third option, let us come back to you with what he's proposed because we believe that it is better for the partners and particularly for the city. And, it, and at least you have three choices because he's prepared to do that. He's already started to do that. He's got a team of experts to do that. And perhaps if he did anything wrong, what everybody did wrong, when Mr. Heffernan suggested an alternative approach to constructing the garages was to not say, whoa, I don't think that's a good idea and, oh, and get the facts. Sorry about that. So um, perhaps you could include in your motion an opportunity for him to demonstrate to you that there is a third better choice for the residents of the city and for the city commission. Or Woodrow, I guess. Sure, hey. Yes, you have a comment? Uh, yeah. Yes, um, I, I, I tend to, um, when I look at this project, uh, we're looking at something that will be lasting for a very long time, decades, decades, if not a century from now. And I, I feel that we've, we've come down this road. Um, I, I, I do feel that another uh, couple of weeks uh, won't hurt. Um, I would like to uh, see what, 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 what is his plan? Um, I, I, I can, I can wait for a couple of weeks based on the impact that this is going to have on our town square project and our city as a whole. Um, and then if it doesn't, uh, pan out, uh, then we, we, we go with, uh, basically what, uh, commissioner Katz's suggestion. Uh, but otherwise, there, there may be an opportunity here uh, that we don't want to close the door on at this uh, point. So um, I, I'm willing to, uh, to to just kind of delay this, postpone it uh, for a couple of weeks, give uh, uh, J, uh, JKM uh, an opportunity to, uh, to put together what they want to present to us, and then we, we move from that point. Mayor. Yes, Commissioner Romulus. Correct me if I'm wrong here, but wasn't that what the purpose of today was? Yes, it was. Um, is that you, Commissioner Katz? Yes, I'm sorry. 
Thank you. Um, the the aspect of today was the initial presentation. Um, as we heard, they, they had access to the numbers three weeks ago. And to order to create documents or binding documents and to look at all the numbers, we are not able to come up with a complete agreement today to finalize. That is kind of what Commissioner Hay is saying is that do we want to have an end date to have this discussion um, so that we can see what the solution is? Because right now we haven't had an opportunity to see what the solution is. And that's where I'd like to do. And that's what I've been saying is that let's hear what's going to happen. Commissioner Hay, I see your hand, hand raising. I was waiting. Yeah, yeah, th that, that's exactly what I'm saying. I, I'd like to hear uh, from uh, from John uh, uh, Mackey uh, if if he can uh, accommodate what we're what we're asking uh, at our next meeting. Uh, I don't want don't come back with another excuse uh, because you that that's not going to sit well at all. So um, I, I would just like to hear from him. Uh, can he accommodate what what what's on the floor here? Uh, is to come back in a couple of weeks and 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 bring us a a, a packet of some options uh, that we could both live with. Uh, thank you, Commissioner. Yes, I can. And what you see on this slide is the solution that we're proposing. My team is just needs more time to get exactly the numbers that we need. We're not guessing here. So we know from the numbers that we've seen that one through six on this slide can be done. We know that number one, subsidize the bond deficit needs to be done. The other things that are here are good things for the community. They're not window dressing. They are what we came up with as trying to do a community benefit. But I'm not asking you to give me this money. I'm asking you to give the community this money. I don't care if I ever touch the TIF money. You, you, you guys are smarter than I am, and, and I would want time to talk with my legal uh, people uh, and, and see, uh, explore the options and, and hear their side of it. And I, I'm not sure that's uh, something that we want to do so, so quickly uh, right now. And I don't think we're prepared to do that. That's my opinion. But I'd like to talk with the uh, city manager and, and, and to, with Jim and, and uh, you know, to explore some things here. So uh, I don't want to rush it, but by the same token, uh, I want to make sure that we're not at the end of the road. I don't feel we are at the end of the road yet because I, I'll be the first one to vote to, to sever the ties and move on. But I don't want to shut the door where there may be an opportunity. That's what I'm saying. So Mayor. That's why I, 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 Mayor. Yes. Well, uh, Commissioner Romulus and Commissioner Katz. So there is a motion on the table and I will be glad to second that motion. And the only wiggle room that I have here is I would be um, more than happy to see something come back to us in two weeks when we have our next commission meeting from JKM regarding whatever other plan it is that he has. Cause in my opinion, I thought that that's what we're looking at right now. But if it's not, then he can bring something back in two weeks and I'd be happy to look at it. But I would still like to entertain the motion of having staff move forward with looking at our options and either saying can we or can we not fulfill the obligations of the contract that is currently in place we have not um lapsed the contract so it's still in place it can still be enforced if the parties feel that they can do it and if not then we need to explore those options but that is the motion that's been put on the table i'm in agreement with it and i'm willing to follow it okay so um Mayor. Yes, Commissioner Katz, you are next, and then Vice Mayor. Thank you. So first I'll say to Commissioner Hay, you are absolutely as smart, if not smarter, than all of us. So, <laughs> so don't say that. Um, I have been sitting here living and breathing this project with everyone else for years. I've been one of the biggest proponents of this project in the downtown revitalization. I have spent the last week speaking to the city manager, staff, and the city attorney. This meeting, as Commissioner Romulus pointed out this meeting was supposed to be what people are asking next meeting to be. So as far as I'm concerned, I'm, I'm looking at a list of, of things meant, I do believe this is window dressing. 
why are we giving money to a, a developer to create a scholarship trust fund? If we want to do that, we can do that. It's our money. Why are we giving money to a developer to create a community revitalization trust? It's our money. If we want to do that, Let's do that, but I don't understand. There, there's a conflation of things going on. I am interested in one thing, delivering on the contract that was made. And if that can't be done, the alternative is find a way to wind down. I, it, it pains me. It pains me to be in this position. I have, I have respect for JKM and John Markey. I have no qualms about anything I've ever heard about their product and, and, and their people, but you know, asking for more time when this was the meeting, this was the meeting to present it. And we made this decision a month ago. We didn't make this decision at the second meeting in August. We said a month ago in the first meeting, September is when we're gonna discuss this. And, and the plan has been presented and I see a lot of nice things, but I don't understand how they are connected to this project. So uh, with respect to the request for additional time, um, you know, uh, there's a motion on the table and I would implore my colleagues, you know, who, who stood with me throughout this discussion to make a firm decision so that we can start to steer this ship in the right direction. I don't think listing in the sea any longer is going to help us. I, I, my problem at this point is faith. I don't know what plan will be put forward if we delay this two weeks, but I can tell you because promises have been made and to me they have not been kept anything that is said from this point on is suspect and and i've lost faith so it, it doesn't matter what's said at this point my position is firm there's a motion on the table christina has seconded it i, I request a third vote to have staff do what the motion states so vice mayor you, you've been a little silent so would you rather let commissioner hay go first um, he can go first, um, but I just wanted to say that I am ready to vote. Okay, Commissioner Hay, yes. I, I just want a, a point, point of clarification on, on the motion. Uh, so this means if we uh, pass this, this motion, uh, then, then the doors are closed for uh, any other uh, possibilities uh, a couple of weeks from now. Is that, what I'm, is that how the vote is going? Or, or does the doors still open with... Uh, possibilities for a couple of weeks. I just want to make sure what so, what we voted on. Thank so the, you. So no, excuse me. We have Commissioner Romulus had put uh, additional statements to your motion, Commissioner Katz. Did you want to accept that? Or Commissioner Romulus, did you want to make a competing amend uh commend amend competing motion to allow for uh, additional my, presentation. Mayor, could we my have motion a motion? My motion as worded. Excuse me, one person at a time. And so I asked Commissioner Romulus regarding her second. No, Mayor, I make no amendment to Commissioner Katz's motion. All right, thank you. Um, so the so, point of clarification, Commissioner Katz, can you restate your motion? Correct, so the direct city staff to put the following two options to JKM. One, to abide the contract and fulfill the obligations within the, the stipulated terms of the agreement and, and explain how they're gonna do that because to date it's been made clear that they do not feel they are capable of doing that as is. Or if they cannot fulfill the agreement, begin negotiations, staff and JKM on how to amicably unwind this relationship so that we can then move forward in a direction that we we had all hoped from the beginning. Those, those are the two options in my motion. All right, thank you. And I'll, I'd like to ask Jim a question regarding the, Jim Cheroff, are you there? I am here. So I wanted to go to the, the first part of Commissioner Katz's motion. Can you please explain what that entails? Well, I think precisely what the motion was, Mayor. So uh, you would be... There's two parts of it. Um, explain how the deal could be fulfilled as written, okay. how the contract could be honored, or if it can't be, if the if option two is uh, the disclosure that it can't be, uh, to negotiate um, 
uh, methodology to unbundle the agreement and the relationship. And so what happens if they say they can complete it and end up not completing it? The traditional remedies for a breach of contract um, that would be available to the city. Okay, but how long would that have to take? Until the breach is identified. Okay. And, and so, some period of time after that. So it could be up until the, the deadline that the breach is identified. Yes, Mayor, that's possible. Okay, so uh, I just wanna make sure the commission is aware that if we state that these are the only two options, we may not have a project by the end of our term of uh, as commissioners and mayor. So I'm open to hearing the, the full presentation in two weeks with the numbers. Um, you know, the, the last month was August. Some people went on vacation. And uh, the fact is, is that the, this what we're looking at was not part of the original contract if this is part of this of the the new contract that means we're getting a better deal um i would like to state that to commissioner katz this is not our money this is the the taxpayers money this is the the money for the city of boyden beach the this and the people in the cra this is not our money and so if we make a decision that says that, hey, we don't want to make, we want the original project from two years ago, not any additions. And that's your point of view. I can understand that. That is not my point of view. I wanna see if we can get additional things as part of our downtown, because workforce housing, rent to own down payment assistance, community revitalization, scholarship trust fund, that is not something the city or the CRA can do because we only can give that money for a community benefits agreement, but I don't believe that's within the city's purview because we don't have a housing authority. So that's that's where I'm at. I'm more with uh, Commissioner Hay to wait at least two more weeks to see what uh, we can get. Commissioner Hay, I see your hand up. I, I, I'd yeah, like to call the question. Last question, last question. But, but I do, I do want to add a motion uh, and a second on the pardon. table for 10 minutes. Excuse me, Commissioner Katz. I would like to call the question. Right. That is not debatable. Okay, Commissioner Hay, you have the floor. Okay, uh, uh, just one last question. Uh, Mr. Markey uh, put up a slide when I asked the question about uh, other options, and he said uh, this, this, this is it. So uh, I want you to think about before you, before you give me a, a yes or no answer, is 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 anything going to change from what you presented on that slide that I saw tonight? If, if we were to come back in a couple of weeks, think about that. But I want uh, I want to hear an answer. If I if I if I could be in order, Mayor, Mayor I, I want to hear an answer before I vote. Can you no, repeat nothing. Your... Nothing is going to change, Commissioner. I I have no intent of changing any of this. We have roughed out the numbers what this works they just need to be exact and we need a little more time to make those numbers exact but we've apportioned what we know would be the tiff increment and how much of it would apply to each one of these numbers one through six i don't plan to change that unless this commission directs that they want to change something okay okay Thanks. vice mayor vice mayor allow you to speak before we call the vote I am ready to vote, you know, um, and you said earlier, Mayor, that I was a little quiet and it's just because between Commissioner Katz and Commissioner Romulus, they've essentially said most of the things that I was thinking. So I am on the same page. Okay. And the only thing additional I would have said is, you know, 25 million, 2 million in cash, and and now we need more incentives. I, I think that's outrageous. We've okay. come to the end. All right. All those in favor of uh, Commissioner Katz's motion state so by saying aye. 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 All those opposed? Nay? Aye. And Commissioner Romulus, I didn't hear you. Aye. Okay, thank you. 
So we are just directing staff to move forward with the original contract or uh, means of unwinding the, the current contract. Thank you very much. And we'll move on to item 9C, proposed resolution 20-091 to adopt a tree planting goal at 3,000 trees per year to achieve 20% tree canopy coverage by 2035 based on recommendations of the attached Boynton Beach Urban Tree Canopy Assessment. First, we have a nice announcement there, Mayor, of a tree giveaway, which will help toward our goal <laughs> so as part of our centennial. And then we have Rebecca Harvey, our sustainability coordinator, who's going to pre present. You have a, a slide presentation in your backup that, that was lengthy. She's going to provide a, a summary of that, of the canopy assessment, as well as some ideas on what we can do to achieve those goals. Correct. Good evening, everyone. It's Rebecca Harvey, sustainability coordinator. I take it by your silence. You can hear me. Yes, we can. Um, Thank you. Yeah. So I do have a brief um, unre uh, related event to announce. The city of Boynton Beach is celebrating our centennial this year. As another way to commemorate the occasion, the city, along with our sustainability partner, Community Greening, and with assistance from the city's marketing department, is hosting a free drive-through centennial fruit tree Centennial Fruit Tree Giveaway on Saturday, September 12th, beginning at 10 a.m. at Sarah Sims Park. Please enter off Seacrest and Northwest 8th Ave and pop your trunk. You do not have to get out of the car. 100 fruit trees will be distributed, one per vehicle on a first come, first serve basis while supplies last. The tree choices will include avocado, mango, and Barbados cherry. More information can be found on our website, gogreenboynton.com. Next slide, please, John. Just a second, it's a separate file. Okay. Um, I'll just add, as um, there you go. Lori mentioned, there is a longer slide deck of, attached to the agenda item, as well as the full report on the tree canopy assessment. Um, so I'll go to the next slide, please. In March of this year, the city adopted its updated 2020 Climate Action Plan, which set targets for a 50% reduction in greenhouse gas emissions by the year 2035 and to reach net zero emissions by 2050. And one of the priority, priority strategies in the plan is urban forestry to maintain and enhance the urban tree canopy. In addition to helping reduce greenhouse gas emissions by sequestering carbon, trees also provide a number of co-benefits that are identified in the climate plan. And these include cost savings, ecosystem protection, economic development, public health, and climate resilience. Next slide. The resolution we're presenting this evening is to adopt a canopy goal of 20% by 2035 and launch a tree planting campaign. But we are not starting from scratch. Largely due to our successful partnership with Community Greening, We've planted more than 700 trees already this fiscal year. And our work with community greening continues. As I mentioned, on September 12th, we have a tree giveaway scheduled. And on October 17th, we have a tree planting at Betty Thomas Park with grant funds from TD Bank. Next slide. In October, we hired the nonprofit Green Infrastructure Center to conduct our first citywide tree canopy assessment. A canopy assessment uses satellite imagery to identify trees and other land cover categories based on remote sensing. It is different from a tree inventory, which surveys individual trees on the ground. So this pie chart and the map show the overall results of our assessment. As you can see, um, the, the chart includes all land cover classes except water. So you can see that more than 50% of our land area is covered by impervious or paved surfaces with 27% um, being covered by grass areas and 5% shrub. And the remaining um, tree canopy plus some mangrove and a small amount of palm add up to a total tree canopy of 16.1%. Next slide, please. 
This map shows the tree canopy coverage by streets. And as you can see, the red and orange streets have very low coverage. In the public input survey that we did as part of this project, streets were ranked the number one priority location for increasing canopy coverage in the city. Next slide. And here we see a map of tree canopy coverage across all city parks. The consultants provided this as a map as well as in a spreadsheet to help us with our planning. And in the public input survey, parks were ranked the number two priority for tree planting locations and low income neighborhoods were ranked number three. Next slide, please. Of all of the ecosystem services that are analyzed in this report, one of the most important is the reduction of urban heat islands. So the map on the left shows the hottest area, uh, areas of the city in orange. And the graph here shows a positive correlation between impervious surfaces, the black line, and increasing temperature along the red line. And the green line is tree canopy cover, showing the inverse relationship the canopy cover has with temperature. Not shown directly in this map, but we do have additional information in the report showing that tree canopy tends to be lower in low income neighborhoods and communities of color, not just in Boynton Beach, but across the country, often burdening the residents with higher temperatures and higher household energy costs. So we are going to look more closely at these data to target and prioritize our tree plantings equitably in the neighborhoods where they're most needed. Next slide. A few words about palms versus canopy trees. Palms, as we know, are iconic in South Florida, but biologically palms are more similar to grasses than they are to trees. Larger palms function like trees in some ways, but because they have shallow roots, skinny trunks, and a narrow, thinner canopy, they do not match the ecosystem services provided, the benefits provided by canopy trees, particularly in terms of stormwater runoff uh, reduction and carbon sequestration. In addition, palms are more expensive to maintain. And the, graph, the graphic here shows results from a study in Central Florida comparing costs and benefits between a palm and an oak as street trees. The palm provided $4 in benefits for every $30 in costs compared to the mature 20-year-old live oak, which provided $80 in benefits for only $16 in costs, so a five-fold return on the investment for the oak tree. And many cities in our region are, are reconsidering their assumptions about landscaping for this reason and moving towards canopy trees. Uh, this slide shows the, the method used to calculate potential planting areas. And I won't go through it in too much detail. The most important um, image here is the one on the top right. Potential planting areas are defined as areas that are currently pervious surface or, or grass areas, not paved, but currently do not have trees. And then we looked at it closely with staff to remove areas of incompatible land use, such as ball fields, such as cemeteries, um, canal right of ways, and so forth, areas that we're not going to target for tree, tree plantings. Um, the rest of this also shows how they, the, the analysis can um, simulate the growth of trees to, to, look, to show what our um, canopy might look like in the future once we plant more of those areas. Next slide. Um, and we do have all this information on our, on our website on gogreenboynton.com as a story map that you can peruse and, and interact with the maps. So I invite you to do that. So following the recommendations of the report, we're presenting a resolution to adopt a goal of increasing the city's tree canopy to 20% by the year 2035, which will require planting about 3,000 trees per year. This is a citywide goal that will entail investments by both the public and private sectors. And um, for example, if, city, if the city were to cover 50% of that cost, that would require a budget of about $190,000 per year. Next slide, please. For the first year of the tree planting campaign, we have not raised that full budget, but what we do have committed so far is 20,000 from the Green Building and Community Sustainability Fund, 14,000 from a grant that we've all, that Community Greening has already received for the tree planting at Betty Thomas Park. And um, on August 11th, the CRA board meeting reached consensus to allocate, allocate 35,550 for tree planting within the CRA area that will be pending budget approval. 
Um, we also have a couple grants that we've already applied for with Community Greening has applied for an Arbor Day Foundation grant and the city has applied for a state grant um, that's a three year program to develop an urban forestry management plan. Next slide. These are our next steps to implement the canopy program. So numbers one through five here are things we're going to move forward with. We don't need to necessarily discuss um, those in much detail, but six, seven, and eight are um, options to consider and that we would like to present to you tonight for, um, for, for your thoughts and some direction. So first among those would be potential landscape code revisions. Um, and we will consider, uh, I guess you could say the low hanging fruit. I realize how many tree puns there are talking about trees. The low hanging fruit would be re requiring trees for single family residential new construction. Um, however, we only have about 29, 30 such permits um, per year. So that would not be a high impact action to produce a bigger impact. We could also require trees for single family residential retroactively. And we can talk a little more about what that might look like um, as property owners come back for permits for home additions or major projects that affect the trees on their property, we could have a retroactive um, provision in our code. Um, number seven, I um, have a bit of a typo here. It says plant trees in swales and single family neighborhoods. We should really be not, not saying swales so much as appropriate areas of the public right of way. Um, and make the distinction between stormwater swales that are used specifically for stormwater conveyance, um, we would avoid those areas, but identify other areas of the right of way that might be appropriate for tree planting. And that would um, have a much larger impact on increasing trees along our streets, which again was the number one priority among the public for, um, for enhancing tree canopy. And another option um, that has been discussed in our public works is to establish a nursery on city property to grow trees ourselves um, to give away and to plant at a lower cost. Next slide, please. And we also have options for raising new revenue for the tree program. These include increasing the existing green building fee, which is currently assessed on all building permits in the city and is currently just 50 cents for every $1,000. If we were to increase that to $1.50 per $1,000, the revenue varies year to year, but looking at recent years, it could be up to an additional $100,000 of potential additional revenue towards our canopy program. Another option would be to establish a developer's tree fund. Many cities do this to require developers to pay a fee in lieu of replacing trees on their site. Um, looking at similar size cities that could also produce about 100,000 or possibly more, hard to say exactly year to year how much revenue we would get. And the other idea that we've discussed that I know the mayor has brought forward before would be a voluntary fee on the utilities bill where, where customers could contribute into a tree fund or a sustainability fund, um, not quite sure since we haven't done that before, how much revenue, probably a smaller pot of revenue from that one. Um, and to conclude my last slide, I'll just quote a recent article that I saw in Bloomberg City Lab. There are a few actions governments can take that fight climate change, improve air and water quality, advance equity, and improve the mental health of citizens all at once. This isn't about scenery. This is about adding life-saving infrastructure for cities. Thank you, and I will open it up for discussion. Thank you, Rebecca. Um, so I, it's interesting that later on this after, uh, evening, we, we were discussing the water utility rates, um, because after speaking with the, the city manager, you know, similar to FPL Solar Now project, I'd like to say that anyone who would like to volunteer to help make payments, or I'm sorry, help volunteer to make the city sustainable through a voluntary payment program uh, start at $5, um, where we can see if that upticks or uh, downticks, it's, you know, I believe it's still, it's extremely able with our third party provider of the water utility bill. It can, 
reach to our customers who are not our customers who are not necessarily residents of Boynton Beach, and that we make sure that those funds um, go to you know the water utility projects, whether it be more trees or uh, sustainable energy. Um, and that's kind of where I'd like to to see it, rather than trying to propose additional costs to developers. And I believe that there are already is, you know, I don't want developers to think that they can pay more money to not have trees on their site. So that that those are, I think, the the voluntary fee is is a good way to see how um, green our city wants to be, and we can put that in perspective because it'd be one thing to spend people's money that don't want it to be spent on this matter. And one of the main things that I, we can see is that we are requesting increased charge for the storm water, which is one of the things that trees vastly help with. So that's kind of where if we don't spend the money now, we're likely to have to spend it later and it'll be a lot more expensive and not as beneficial. Yes, Vice Mayor. Thank you, Mayor, and thank you to Rebecca for that presentation. Rebecca, I did want to ask you regarding your proposals. Um, have you seen other cities uh, use those as kind of as models? I always like to look at our neighbors and see what other people are doing to see what's working and not working. Yes, I do. I do like to do that as well. Um, John, maybe you could go back two slides so we could look at the implementation suggestions. Um, for the landscape code changes, I, I'm part of the Florida Sustainability Directors Network, which is about 80 people in my position throughout the state. And um, I have reached out to them numerous times with tree questions. So I'm also working with my colleague in Boca. We're both working on this. So we're compiling information um, for uh, tree requirements in single family. There are a number of cities, just to list a few, Miramar, Miami Beach, Miami Coral Springs, Winter Park, St. Petersburg, and a, at least a couple of those that I've seen specifically, um, three of them that I know specifically do have a retroactive provision, not just for new construction. So yes, we could look at those. Um, trees in right of way and streets, there are a number of examples of that as well, and I'm gathering that information. The city nursery, I do not know another city that's doing that, so that's a pretty unique idea. <laughs> okay, thank you. Sure, thank you. Yes, Commissioner Hay. Uh, yes, I, I, Rebecca, this, this is a fantastic program. Uh, uh, I really support it. But I just wanted, if you could, uh, tell me, how, how do you go about measuring uh, deficiency you know like uh, is there some formula that you use or you just keep putting them wherever you can put them I'm sorry Commissioner your audio is a little quiet how do I figure which which part exactly I I, I don't know if anybody heard me that I'm having audio trouble but uh, what I what I what I was asking is how do you measure where to put trees or how many Yes. Put or okay, all of it. Okay, sure. Um, so like I said, the, the consultant is the Green Infrastructure Center that are national experts in doing this type of work. Um, they first mapped out existing tree canopy, and then they define the potential planting areas as areas um, that do not have trees, but have uh, pervious surfaces, so basically grassy areas that aren't already paved. I mean, we could go further and take out pavement. I would love to do that, but that's probably not <laughs> so uh, feasible. So looking just at the grassy areas that are open, and then we, we took out the areas that we know we can't plant in, like ball fields, cemeteries, and certain right-of-ways um, and other uses. So it was um, identified or quantified from that assessment that while 16% of our city is currently tree canopy, another 7.4% is potential planting area. And the goal of 3,000 trees per year 
Um, well, essentially we picked 20% because being at 16%, we're a bit lower than our neighbors. Um, and due to hurricanes in recent years our, our, and development, our trees have been reduced. So to get back to 20% seems like a reasonable goal and lining that up with the climate action plan goal of 2035 uh, the Green Infrastructure Center gave us a calculator that identified that that would be 45,000 trees between now and 2035 to grow from 16% to 20%. 45 divided by 15 is 3,000 trees per year. Um, and, and planting those 45,000 trees would end up using just 30% of the total potential planting area. So it's not an unrealistic goal of planting every single empty spot in the city. It's a third of the identified available planting spots. Okay, thanks Rebecca. You're welcome. Is there any other comments from the, the commission? Thank you, Rebecca. Thank you. Oh, the resolution. Yes. Do we have Thank you. All those in favor, state so by saying aye. 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 All those opposed? Hearing none, motion passes unanimously. I'd like this mayor to move forward with the um, voluntary to to develop a, a voluntary sustainability fund. I know you mentioned it, but we really didn't get a. I a think we'll one. we'll talk about it at this next resolution because it's the okay. where we would fi uh, find it, um, okay. and that that wasn't part of the original resolution. So no. proposed resolution number twenty zero nine two authorize the city to set rates, fees, and charges for waste water, wastewater, stormwater, reuse water and district energy chilled water for the upcoming fiscal 2021 year. Is there a presentation or just the- uh, I think staff is prepared, I'm yeah. waiting for Colin. Yeah, are you there Colin? Yes, I'm here. If you want a presentation, uh, Joe Paternetti can, the utility director, he will go through it. It's very quick just to go over the rates that we're, yeah. uh, we're looking at. I'm gonna turn it over to Joe. Yeah, I'm here. Can you hear me, uh, commissioners? Yeah. Yes. Excellent. Excellent. Good evening, uh, Mayor and commissioners. My name is Joe Paternity, utility director. Um, you've seen this presentation before, but for public uh, viewing here, we're going to go through it again. Um, this uh, shows the uh, utility budget proposed for 2021, not 2010, um, with a total uh, budget of 52 million um, two hundred. $25,066. Um, I'll discuss how we develop those uh, costs in, in, in upcoming slides here that'll, that'll we'll talk about how we use the uh, price indices. Next slide, please. This slide shows the current funding projection, revenue projections, and then the balance transfer to balance the, uh, the uh, proposed costs. And this, the revenue is pretty much driven by the reclaimed water customers, and we're also increasing our water customers with the town of Hypoluxo. So that's going to be driving our revenue up a little bit as well. Um, so, um, next slide, please. This slide shows the four budget categories in the utility budget uh, the operating budget, 35 million. Uh, we're, we're dedicating 8 million for renewal and replacement. We're providing uh, intergovernmental transfers, and that totals up to be the 52 million of our operating budget. And then we have a capital budget proposed of 17,926,000. Next slide, please. Now, in order to adjust the um, operating budget from year to year, we utilize the consumer price indices, and we use those to either increase or decrease those um, those amounts in each of the uh, budget categories or accounting categories. Um, staff reviews the incremental changes based on the consumer price index for those funds and um, 
we can make adjustments based on what our uh, what we know. Um, say that the um, for an example, if we anticipate using more uh, county water, we can increase that budget amount to uh, amount uh, to pay for that that expenditure. So we can make adjustments along the way. Now the rate model that we use calculates all the utility projected costs, the anticipated growth over 30 year period, and we, so we can establish the, uh, the utility rates. Next slide, please. And based on our evaluation, we're, we're holding the water rates constant, the wastewater rates constant, and the chilled water rates constant for this upcoming budget year. We're proposing an increase to the reclaimed rates of, of two cents, and that 50% increase in the stormwater fee, which will yield, I think, Mayor, you asked a question last time, uh, it yield another $350,000 into that fund uh, for, for stormwater. Next slide, please. This slide, just, this slide just shows the summary of the increases between the current and the new year. And we show the, the increase in the stormwater rate going up from 650 per EDU per month to seven dollars and then we our, our reclaim is going up two cents per thousand gallons <clears throat> we also have a, a, a sewer reclaimed rate of 26 cents for scheduled delivery the 38 cents is for delivery um, on demand but if they schedule delivery we're giving them a break um, energy district energy um, rates are going to stay the same next slide this this next slide shows just a comparison of the customers bills between the inside and outside city um, inside the city limit um, a single family home using 3,000 gallons of water will have an incremental increase in their utility bill um, of uh, just includes the uh, the 50 cents for the uh, stormwater fee increase so this is a this slide summarizes a lot of the various increases in the bills for each of the inside and outside city customers. Next slide. I guess the next step is to approve the resolution associated with the rates. And uh, these new rates will become effective October 1st. And uh, Mayor, you mentioned also the, uh, the voluntary charge. I, I think that's something that the customer relations division can accommodate for us. And we can put that in the on the utility bill and collect funds and make it a separate account if i can work with finance to do that yeah it's the the aspect is working with finance and legal regarding yes. the, the application uh to to do it and to, to know when you can withdraw from it as well right. and then and we, the, only other, the only, only other comment that i wanted to make is that your numbers did not include um the sanitation part of our bill and uh, which did that stay the same or increased uh is that staying the same or increasing i guess i'll ask laurie or colin i yes I, yeah there was a scheduled increase uh colin i just don't know it off the top of my head we okay. did a three-year that, that, that's fine i just want to know that i get a cheat tomorrow so if everybody yeah, sees that hey you know i spent ten thousand dollars i'm sorry ten thousand gallons and my bill's not 75, it's because there's also the sanitation rate uh, that is on that same utility bill. That's a good point, Mayor, yes. So, uh, so I guess um, I'll ask uh, the commission if they have any questions or comments and then I'll um, yeah. go ahead. Commissioner. Uh, uh, Just a, a quick question, uh, 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 Joe. Um, uh, would you go back over why there's a there's an increase in uh, storm water and re reuse on demand and schedule? I think that's in city. Sure. That, that um, yeah, the utility pretty much subsidizes those rates. Um, they the, the, the rate we're collecting for storm water and re well the rate we're collecting for reclaimed doesn't really pay for the cost of reclaimed so we're trying to increase the rate to better better meet our revenue requirements and then the um stormwater fee it, it typically doesn't cover the cost of 
actually maintaining the stormwater system throughout the city of Boynton Beach. So those fees are subsidized by the wastewater and the water distribution, water, water, water fees that we, we charge. So that's kind of why we're trying to increase those fees. If that so, makes sense. Yeah, Col yeah, Colin Groff, Assistant City Manager. I, yeah, I want to add to what Joe said. About three years ago, I know Commissioner Hay, you weren't on the board at the time, but we had presented the stormwater and how the subsidies were working, and we had come up with a plan over the next four or five years to get the stormwater back in line. Stormwater is probably one of the fastest expense growing areas due to climate change, sea level rise, um, and and the rainfall changes. It is one of our most demanding departments and demanding for funds. So what we're trying to do is get to the point where it's still going to be subsidized, but subsidized a lot less than it is right now. That's um, correct. Okay. Could have Thanks, said it so, And then if there's no other comments, I'll ask the, the city commission if they would approve putting on a, a voluntary charge of five dollars mayor uh, yes vice mayor i did have a question uh, regarding your proposal i just wanted some clarity um is the intention uh, to divert those voluntary funds for um the tree fund is that the intention it initially I say direct to the tree fund it, initially it would be direct towards the the tree fund as part of the water utility sustainability fund okay however i would hope that once revenue uh if it ever it gets to a certain point of thousands of dollars a month that we could uh begin looking into building solar canopies and other sort of energy producing aspects because uh what is it the water utility spends $1.2 million in electricity each year. Uh, I believe that number is going to grow up, grow as time goes on when oil prices get higher. So sure. with that, I feel that it's it's the aspect of creating uh, a sustainable Boynton Beach through the the water utility based on voluntary. It's kind of you know some individuals want to will pick up trash that's not their own on the streets. And so I want to give everyone an opportunity that feels that they want to are okay with spending $60 a year or $5 a month to make uh, the city of Boynton Beach a little bit greener. Right. Uh, I support this proposal. Thank you. And so I'll, I'll ask you to, to make the, that motion to, to approve the, the resolution and add uh, a $5 uh, voluntary charge subject to legal's approval. All right, so move. Okay. Thank you. All those in favor, state so by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Hearing none, motion passes unanimously. And legal proposed resolution 20-093. Approve and authorize the mayor to sign documents releasing and creating project easements. Mayor, it may be appropriate in light of the earlier uh, direction by the commission regarding the town square project to table this matter and explore um, the alternative that's listed in your agenda item, which says include the easement releases and new agreements into a comprehensive amendment to the development documents. So. Um, I would suggest you table this matter for one meeting. Motion to table. Second. All right. Second. Mayor, did we adopt the resolution for the rates? I'm sorry if I I, I missed yes. it, or did we we approved the uh, voluntary fund? No, no, no. we uh, no, um, Lori, uh, we did uh, approve the the resolution uh, that was uh, uh, first with. Um, Vice Mayor and seconded by Commissioner Hay. Thank you. With I missed it. The, with the direction to add a five dollar charge subject to legal. Hmm. Thank you, sir. That's all right. So okay. So we have a first and second. All those in favor, state so by saying aye. 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 All those all those opposed? Hearing none, motion passes unanimously. Thank you. It will be back on the agenda next time. Um, All right. So we'll table it until next meeting. 
Yes, sir. Uh, the the next thing uh, regarding the future agenda, um, yeah, I have it to request a discussion regarding education in Boynton Beach. I think we've been having that with our um, donation to the Education Foundation. Um, I know that our city staff is um, is working so that all of our employees have uh, adequate child care, and um, I think that's something that we can remove from the, the future agenda. Unless and hope that we have a conversation with some of our school board commissioners in the near future, how things are going, and how things you know how things are. And so I'll request that motion uh, to take that off the the future agenda. So moved. Second. Uh, all those in favor, state so by saying aye. 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 All those opposed? And also item 13D, I think we discussed it tonight. So that's no longer needed. All right. And is there anything else? Um, oh yeah, there, the one last thing that I wanted to know if the, the commission is willing to look at our workforce housing ordinance subject to the, the new norms that we in to try to create a subsidized housing ordinance so that there is flexibility uh, in it to allow for different options to, for density with the very low and low income um, units or payments for those units. Mayor, I'd, I'd be happy to entertain that conversation uh, with some other um, amendments that I'd like to potentially add to that ordinance as well. Thank you. Do I have uh, someone else for consensus? Sure. Thank you. So, uh, Lori, we have a consensus to put on uh, our workforce housing ordinance to get an update uh, to see if we can't put some subjectivity into it, along with uh, Commissioner Romulus's comments that she'll let you know. Mayor, when would you like to do that? Um, well, no, let's not plan for next meeting. Let's do some time in October, uh, and if staff needs additional time, November. Thank you. All right. Question. Can, yes. Uh, question for for Lori. Uh, I had to get off that uh, uh, kind of commissioners meeting today. Did they vote to go to phase two, or are they going to go with the five step approach? They, they Honestly, I had to. They were still debating that when we started our commission meeting. Honestly, uh, oh. so I don't know. I'm going to go look it up. Okay. okay. Uh, I'll find out. And let you all know tomorrow. They had multiple hours of debate over that today, and they were still debating at 5:30. And I'll look it up. Miss Oyer, I'm sorry. Um, I know that you wanted to to speak on certain items. Um. um but we, we we failed to we closed down the the hand raising and the the question ability so i wasn't able to get you in time i saw your text message do you still have comments Ms. sawyer yes of course i do okay and it and it was never turned on since the public hearing since the public speaking portion which, all right you know, this is now a couple meetings in a row and you adopted a money thing for the utility fees without any public input and that i think is a, a big issue but i will get on topic and go back to um what i wish to speak about during the tree giveaway portion to give some additional information that rebecca harvey was not aware of first of all we have had a nursery in the past in our city and this would not be starting anything new this would be bringing back what we had in the past where there were trees available and plants available. When they did um, prunings and cuttings, they would just get starts going and give away free trees and plants all the time. So I think we should go back to doing this again. Um, as far as the, um, oh, and I wanted to also remind you that CRA survey shows beautification is the number one issue for our businesses in this city. So the more we can do and I would think the businesses would want to be involved, especially since this was their number one key issue 
was beautification in our city. And I don't remember the exact placement it was for the residents, but I wanna say it was the top five. So I think this is um, something that the businesses and the residents will gladly behind. And I, what I want to speak about for the water fees is you guys just arbitrarily put in a $5 fee towards the trees. And my thought was, is why not do Voluntary. what? Yes. Yeah, so That's not mandatory. No, but my thought was, why not do what um, the different retailers do and round up to the next dollar or round up to the next $5 increment? That way people at the lower end of the income spectrum who maybe cannot afford the five full dollars or $60 a year would still be able to participate in a meaningful manner within this city. So it's not just something for the middle and upper classes in our city, but the lower income would also be able to take pride in being a part of this by rounding up, you know, the 30 cents, the 70 cents, whatever it is, or rounding up to the next $5 increment, because maybe it is only a dollar or two, but that would be much more affordable for all of our residents versus the $60 a year that they might not necessarily be able to afford. And that's what I had wanted to put in before you had a vote on resolution 20-092 and you did not allow any public input. So thank you very much. Thank you. And there's no other comments from the, the commission. I'll ask for a motion to adjourn. So, all right. John, can you provide a closing? Yes, sir. As a reminder, a recorded version of this session will be posted to the City of Boynton Beach's YouTube channel. Links to that channel are available on the City of Boynton Beach's website at www.boynton-beach.org. This concludes today's meeting. On behalf of Mayor Grant and all of our elected officials, the city manager and city staff, thank you for attending today's City of Boynton Beach Commission meeting. Be safe and have a great evening. All right, bye-bye. All right, good night.